So, anyway, welcome. Uh, Roy has already given a first few words of welcome. Let's welcome him once again. Um, what I'm going to try to do today again in an hour's time is to introduce you to Bayesian networks. You now, Bayesian networks are really the tools that people use for understanding complex statistical problems or complex machine learning problems, a uh, whole variety of problems. Um, in the last, when we met last time, I had talked about probability and I talked about probability as a method of trying to understand uncertainty. And we had given that simple example of looking at coin tosses and how to tell whether the coin is fair or not fair. Okay. And we had that little program which shows you uh, as you toss the coin more and more, how your state of knowledge about the fairness of the coin changes. So what we're going to do is we're going to take off from that point today. Again, just to remind you, uh, any programs that I use are available at the GitHub repository, and my slides will appear on speaker deck. Last time it wasn't working, now it is. Apparently, I got caught in the speaker deck spam filter for some reason. Okay. So what? This is, this is my uh, motivation and introduction for this for this uh, for this, for this Okay. So as I said, from last time, I want to do a very quick recap. So those of you, <coughs> is there anybody who is coming here for the first time? Raise your hands. Okay. So that's about four or five people. Okay. So is it because you were, was it, you couldn't come the last time because it was full? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we want limited volume. Right. So then what, what do I do? Because so what, what, what I'm going to say right recap. now. Yeah. Okay, so let me at least tell those who were here last time what's going to happen, and then maybe I'll try to do a very quick recap for people who are here for the first time. Okay, so what we're going to do is we are going to take the stuff that I talked about last time, essentially using probability as logic, and we're going to make it a little bit more complicated. Okay, so the example that I dealt with last time was very simple. You have a coin, you're tossing it, and you know you want to know whether the so coin is uh, fair or unfair. But you know when you're applying probably to real life problems, the situations are really that simple. You have very complicated yeah. things which are influencing each other. So A is influencing B, B is influencing C, and in another complicated situation, you still want to say something sensible. Okay? And this is where the difference between what we're going to do and what the conventional approaches are come into play. Okay? So typically when you, you know, most of the stuff that goes on right now is based around statistics. So in statistics, you have a bunch of numbers, or you have a bunch of whatever tables, etc., and you're trying to figure out what is the correlation between columns of the table. That's typically your you know, uh, method of analysis. Okay, you're trying to find out does something depend on something else, or are two things by some measure of probability close to each other? Or something. Now, what that does is it just uses numbers as very black box entities. Okay, so typically statistical algorithms tend to be very bad, black box. As a user of a typical statistical algorithm, you really know what is going on inside the algorithm. Okay, so you're sending in some data, the algorithm is doing some churn, and something else is coming about. Okay, so for those of you who are already a little bit into this, can you tell me what kind of statistical algorithms you have used, for instance? Linear regression. So linear regression, okay. And any other? So linear regression, one, okay. Any other statistical algorithms that you've used? Sorry? Correlation. Correlation analysis. Okay. Monte Carlo. Sorry? Yeah, that's correct. Monte Carlo. Someone said Monte Carlo. Who said Monte Carlo? Monte Carlo. Okay. What, where, in what context did you use Monte Carlo? We were like designing a lot of on-chip variations on how we need to get Okay. Right. So okay. Depending upon the several types. Yeah. We get the numbers from there to there. Okay. So Monte Carlo simulation. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So anyway. So, so for instance, when you're doing linear regression, what is your physical assumption? So you can apply linear regression to anything, right? Any data that you have, you can try and see if there's a linear regression. So then what is the underlying causal mechanism which is causing? So what, what are you trying to understand in linear regression? You're saying, I have some variable, let me call that y. There is another variable, let me call that x. And y and x sort of are dependent on each other linearly. Okay? Now, if this were just a straight line, I could just fit the straight line. But typically, the data that is coming to me has a lot of fluctuations in it. And I, from under that fluctuation, I want to recover what is the linear variation between these two uh, variables. Okay? So now, 
that is the typical thing that you do in statistics. And so you mentioned correlations. Again, when you're doing correlations, you're trying to see, OK, here's a variable, here's another variable. When this variable goes up, what happens to this variable? Does it also go up? Does it go down? Does it stay the same? OK, so that's correlation analysis. Okay. Now, these kind of things you can do for any problem. Okay, It doesn't require you to understand what is the mechanism by which if something goes up, something else is also going up. Or if something goes up, something else is going down. Okay. So the physical mechanisms which are leading to this kind of behavior is not necessarily a question that is even asked in statistics. Okay. You're just asked to give me a number. Are these two variables correlated or are they uncorrelated? What is the slope of the regression curve? So these are the typical questions that, and this is the way statistics is typically done. And this is also a reason why when you're doing statistics, things have a very black box flavor. Okay, so you just send in something, something comes out. Okay, because it is supposed to be a very generic tool. You're supposed to apply to everything. Okay? What we want to do is to completely turn the focus around to something which is called a white box approach. Okay, so here in the white box approach, you are actually modeling what is going on. Okay, you're trying to understand precisely. If you see a correlation, you're trying to understand what is the source of that correlation. You're trying to model that correlation itself. Okay? So that cannot be done. So what is good about this is its causal reasoning. Okay, if something is happening, this is already giving you an understanding of why that is happening. Okay, so it's a much more informed way of doing it. You, as a domain expert, you have a much better grip on what it is that you're doing. Okay, and the insights that you get from this are also much more informative. Okay, rather than just have some numbers, you actually have some sense of feel for what is going on. So this is this white box approach. And what this white box approach does is to combine probability theory, which is the uncertainty part, with graph theory, which is the complexity part. Okay? So you take probability theory, you take graph theory, you put these two things together, and what you get are what are called probabilistic <coughs> graphical models, or Bayesian networks, or whatever. Okay? So they, they, they have various names, depending on you know, some change, minor change in details of what exactly what kind of you know, dependencies these things encode. But the general idea is that there's an aspect of probability and there's an aspect of graphs which encodes complexity. And this is a framework for reasoning under uncertainty and complexity. Now, the good thing about this is that although I'm saying that you know we're going beyond statistics, what this does is this, this approach encompasses all the statistical analysis that you could ever do. So if you're doing regression, you can cast your regression problem as a probabilistic problem. If you're doing Clustering, you can cast it as a graphical model. If you're doing classification, you can cast it as a graphical model. Okay, so almost anything that you could do within within a sort of black box statistical approach, you can also do within this approach. Okay. So this is really the power of this approach, and it's you know because it is a slightly so historically what has happened is you know statistics has been around for a long time, probability has been around for a long time, graph theory has been around for a long time. But combining all of these things has happened very recently. It's not more than 15 years old. Okay? And uh, you know, the, one of the very sort of important people in this field is someone called Judy of Pearl. He's the father of the journalist who was killed in Pakistan called Daniel Pearl, if you remember that person. Okay, there was even a movie, a Hollywood movie, based on that incident. Okay? So he is Daniel Pearl's father. And he's one of the first people who actually realized that you can put graph theory probability theory together to have a framework where you can reason under uncertainty in complex situations. Okay. So the name Pearl will come up fairly often in what I'm going to discuss because he's one of the really important people. Okay. So just like last time, I introduced probability and then I gave a very simple example, which was the coin tossing example. What I'll do here is exactly the same. I'll try to introduce okay. now, this is a very, very big discipline. Okay. It's got in immense 15, 20 years, people have been working on it very intensely. So I will be able to only give you a very uh, sort of short flavor of what is going on. But what I'll do is I'll give you a very simple example. So you should really think of this as the analog of the coin tossing problem. Okay. If the coin tossing okay. problem is the paradigm for probability, this problem, the Monty Hall problem, is the paradigm for Bayesian networks. Okay. So once, if you understand the details, these are very, both of them are very simple problems. But if you understand them in detail, you will actually get to the heart of it. Okay. So for those of you who have come here for the first time, do you have some basic understanding of probability theory? Yes. Is if you do not have any understanding of probability theory, will you please raise your hands? Those of you who have come for the first time and you don't know probability theory, 
Raise your hand. One. I've come oddly, but you still have that glass. You, 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 you don't have so much of glass knowledge. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's see what, what, what's the. So I'll very briefly, again, at the cost of boring those people who have already been here, I'll just very briefly go back to my slides from last time and tell you what the basic idea is. Okay. Very briefly. Otherwise, you know, there'll be a huge amount of discontinuity. In <coughs> okay. So let me skip all of this stuff okay, and go straight to this. Okay, so those of you who are here, are you familiar with Boolean logic? Yeah. Yes, okay, so Boolean logic, very good. So as I said, one of the main sort of themes of, of this workshop series is to try to figure out how to reason under uncertainty. Okay, that is one of the main things. Okay, we are trying to do reasoning rather than just do statistics. Okay. And the basic tool for reasoning is logic, right? At least Boolean logic. Okay. So this is really a formalization into mathematics of the logic of Aristotle. And it has basically these, essentially these ideas that you have a set of propositions. These could be statements about something, real world or not. And these propositions have the property that they're either true or false. Okay? So they have only two values. The propositions are either true or false. And what you can do with these propositions is you can do various kinds of operations on them. You can do conjunctions which basically means you combine two of two statements, A and B. You can do disjunctions, A or B, and you can do negations, not A. Okay, so the negation operator requires exactly one operand. The conjunction and disjunction operators require two operands. Okay. Now, once you have these things, what you do is you define what are called laws. Okay, now, these laws are essentially compound statements which have two different forms, but which are identical in their truth or falsity value. Okay. So which basically means that supposing I take this take this statement, A and B, and then I ap apply the negation operator on it. So not A and B. Okay. Now you can see it takes a few minutes or if it's obvious to you, you can see it immediately that this the value of this is the same as the value of not A or not B. Okay. So Similarly, not A or B is again not A and not B. Okay, so these these two identities are very famous. They call the De Morgan identity. Okay, so now what these Boolean laws are are a sequence of statements like this. So you can make this more and more complicated. It doesn't have to be this. So you have a whole complicated compound statement on this side. You take it to that side, and that becomes a different kind of compound statement, perhaps in terms of things that you want. Okay, so what is the utility of this? So these are rules for reasoning consistently with certain propositions. If I mean certain, I don't mean x, y, I mean I mean which are which 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 are either true or false. Okay, that's what I mean by a certain proposition. So these are my rules for reasoning consistently. Okay. And this this bunch of rules is what we use in computers all the time, right? So all the logic gates that you're using are essentially doing a series of these operations all the time. Okay. But the the value of these things are always zero or one. That means it's either true or false. But when you try to apply this to a real life situation, you have a situation where your proposition, you're not always sure about the proposition. Okay? It may be true, it may be false. Okay, for those of you who are just coming in, there are some new people who have come in, so I'm just very quickly doing a recap of some of the things I did did last time. Okay. So you don't you don't always know whether your proposition is true or false. You might have a hunch about it. Okay. So your proposition. So for instance, if you're watching an IPL match and your favorite team is playing, you don't know whether your team is going to win or lose. Right? At some point in time, the outcome is clear. But while you're watching the match, the outcome is not clear. So you have a guess. It may, they may win, they may lose. Okay? So under a lot of these situations where you want to apply logic to real life, the truth value of your proposition is unknown. Okay? So you do not know whether you have a proposition which is true or false. Okay? So under those cir circumstances, what, what people do is they introduce probability theory, where now propositions have a truth value of p, which conventionally is taken to lie between 0 and 1, where 0 means the proposition is false, and p means the proposition is true. And if you have p anywhere in between, it gives you a measure of how certain you are about the truth value of that thing. Okay? So if you have a truth value of p close to 9, you're pretty sure that, sorry, 0.9, you're pretty sure that that, that thing is going to be 
true, right? And now you can again ask, if I know the truth value of a certain proposition, one proposition, what is the truth value of their conjunctions, disjunctions, and their negations? Okay. Now, this is where the basic rules of probability theory come in. So there are exactly two rules. So again, last time I had mentioned that if you look at logic gates, you don't need all three <coughs> operations. Right? You can choose any two of the operations and take them to be fundamental operations. Okay? So typically, you can take not or and as the fundamental operation, or you know, and and not or as a fundamental operation. Uh, sorry, not, not and or as a fundamental operation. So similarly here, when you're doing probability theory, you can choose any two of these to be the fundamental operations. What I have chosen here is not and and. Okay? So these are essentially the only two rules that you need to know to manipulate probabilities. So just like you need the truth table to manipulate Boolean propositions. So if you have a Boolean proposition, you set up a truth table for these things, and that tells you how to manipulate, manipulate a, a comp compound proposition like that. When you're doing probability, you need exactly two rules. One is called the sum rule, which says that if you have specified the probability of a statement A, you have impli implicitly specified the statement of its negation. Okay, so if you basically it means, in words, it means if you say how much you believe in something, you have implicitly said how much you believe in its negation. Okay? So if I believe that Chennai Super Kings is going to win today's match with probability 0.6, I also mean that whoever is the opponent, let's say Kolkata Knight Raiders, is going to lose the match with probability 0.4. Okay? So this is a fundamental rule of probability theory which actually inherits from Boolean logic. Okay? Because in the Boolean logic, something is either A or not A. There's no in-between situation, okay? excluded middle. So P of A and P of not A is equal to 1 is one of the first rules. And then the second rule is what is the probability of P of A and B? And this, this time I've got it right. It's P of A given B into P of B or it's P of B given A into P of A. And here this bar is a very important operator. It says condition on. It basically means that I'm saying P of A and B, the probability of that is, let me assume first that B has happened and what is the probability of A times the probability that B itself has happened. Okay? So this conditioning assumes that B has occurred. Okay? And then I multiply it with the probability that B occurs. Okay? And this actually doesn't care about which order I do it. So P of A and B is symmetric under interchange of A and B. Okay. Now, if you take this and if you take this, and if you go back and remember the De Morgan identity, which says P of not A and B, not A and B, you can see I have here A and B, and I have not A. What I do is I just replace A by the compound statement A and B, and I fiddle around, use the De Morgan identity, use the De Morgan identity, and I'll get a uh, manipulation rule for this junction. Okay? So A or B is now P of A plus P of B minus P of A and B. Okay? So starting with these two fundamental rules and the De Morgan identity from Boolean logic, I can get all the three rules that I need to manipulate probabilities. Okay? So you can manipulate probabilities only by these three, three rules, nothing else. Okay? And there are two important kinds of propositions. If a proposition satisfies this property, that P of A given B is P of A, then this, these two propositions are called independent propositions. The truth of one does not influence the truth of the other. And if P of A or B is just P of A plus P of B, then they're called mutually exclusive. Because P of A and B can never happen. Okay, so P of A and B is zero. So these are two very important kinds of propositions, one which are independent and the other which are mutually exclusive. Okay, so mutually exclusive propositions cannot have to happen together. Independent propositions have this factorizability property in their properties. Okay. Now what I did then was to go to Bayes' theorem, which is a very important theorem, very, very important for inference, which basically takes this product rule and turns it around. <coughs> so you take this product rule and you eliminate this term itself. And therefore, you have a rule for P of A given B in terms of P of B given A. Okay. So now this looks like elementary manipulations, but it's actually quite important. Okay. Because this, this is the key for doing inference. Okay. What do I mean by inference? By inference, I mean that I have a situation 
where a multiplicity of causes can occur, can lead to a certain surface phenomena. I don't know what those causes are. I can only see the surface phenomena. And from that surface phenomena, I have to figure out what are the causes which are likely leading to that surface phenomena. Okay? And the, the classic example of a general inference problem is when you go to a doctor. You go to a doctor, you tell him or her that you have a certain bunch of symptoms. And from that, the doctor is supposed to tell you what, what is wrong with you and also to suggest a fix, which is to take medicine. Okay? So there is both the diagnosis part which is the inference part, and then there's the action part, which is the intervention. So I have to intervene. So if there is something wrong, I have to intervene and set it right. Okay? So these are the general aspects of uh, a general inference problem. Okay? So here, this thing of going from disease to symptom. So given the symptom, tell me what disease I have. This is generally something which we are not very good at estimating. Okay? But whereas we are pretty good at estimating, given that I have a disease, what is the probability of a symptom? Okay? So this is much easier to estimate. Okay? So we know this empirically. If I have, okay, I, sort of, I don't want to give examples. You can, you know, I, I, I find these things a little sort of morbid, you know, giving examples about illness. But okay, so you can figure out that you know, if you have a certain disease associated with them are a bunch of symptoms. Okay? And you can estimate this even if you don't know <coughs> microbiology or if you don't know what is happening at the microscopic level inside your bodies, just by empiricism you can estimate these things. Okay? P of symptom given disease. Okay. So this is something that doctors from you know, ancient times they knew that if you have this, you're likely to be seeing this kind of symptom. But what is, that, what is it that you want to know? You don't want to know this. You want to know what is the disease given that I have a bunch of symptoms. Okay? And that's where Bayes' theorem comes in. So you can use Bayes' theorem to flip these two things around. So this is where you're using Bayes' theorem. You're using exactly this. Set A to be disease, B to be symptom, and then do, th do that little bit of algebra, and then you get this. Okay. And this is, where, this is the typical situation that you have when you have an inference problem, that you have a whole bunch of symptoms. Associated with that are a whole bunch of you know, diseases. And the doctor is to tell you which of these is what you're likely to have, and then suggest suggest a fix for it. Okay, so if you have flu and cold, you do something else. If you're under stress and if you have a concussion, you do something else. Okay. Right. So this is what I had said last time, very briefly. And then I had mentioned this whole acronym, which is very important for the steps that you do when you're actually doing, uh, generally sort of you know, tackling one of these problems. So you figure out what is the representation of your problem. What are the important variables that you should be looking at? How they are connected? Okay, so that's the representation part. And then there's the inference learning and actions part, which I'll talk about very soon. Okay. And what we did was, we did a very simple example of looking at tossing a coin. Okay. So the, the question here is that you're tossing a coin. Tell us, after a few tosses, what is the probability that the coin is fair? Okay. And we had even seen a little code where this thing is given. Right. So what we had done was, for, and the code is available on, on the GitHub repository. So for those of you who are now from last time, this should be familiar. So what is going on here is we're tossing a coin, and there's a computer program which is telling you what is the fairness of the coin. Okay. So zero tosses, zero heads. So this is the probability of the coin having a fairness value of anything between. So if the fairness value is half, the coin is fair. If it's less than half, it's you know, either bias towards heads or tails. Okay, and what you do is you keep on tossing the coin, and then you know this probability distribution kind of starts converging to a certain place. <coughs> and uh, this is what we had done last time. And I think I'm not going to spend too much time on it. For those of you who have come in, this is there in the GitHub repository, and we can we can talk about this in the in in the afternoon session. Okay, in more, more detail. Okay, I'll now sort of feed back in to what we were trying to do. So, so, so those of you who are here, who were here from last time, what I want to do is I want to sort of get into one point of view, which is illustrate what is wh wh why even such a simple program is actually. So this doesn't seem to.
Okay, so what I want to do is, so this is the Wikipedia article on machine learning. Can, I want to give us, you know, there's so much of sort of, uh, when I look at the Twitter feeds and this thing and things, you know, people don't seem to understand what exactly is learning and lots of things are said to be learning when they're actually really not learning. Okay. So I want to talk, uh, give this quote from Mitchell who's really uh, uh, sort of <coughs> really important person in machine learning. So a computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks T. And I will just read this out <coughs> because it seems that it's not going to show up here. Okay, so this is the definition, formal definition of learning. Okay. A computer program is said to learn from experience E with some set with respect to some class of tasks T and performance measure P. So there are three things. There is experience E some class of tasks T and there's a performance measure P. Okay, so three things are there. If, what, what happens? If its performance at tasks T as measured by P improves with experience E. Okay. So what, what is it? There are three things. There is a bunch of experiences, which in this context is data. There is a bunch of tasks you have to do, which are t, and there's a measure of how good you're doing at that task, okay? which is which is p. Okay, and now the whole idea is that if your program can improve in doing the task t as measured by the performance metric p, then you have a program which can learn. Okay, now this looks like a very complicated thing to do, but I want to show you, I want to emphasize to you that even this little program that we have written last time actually does exactly this. Okay? And I want you to suggest to me why it does exactly this. So let me run this program once again. Okay? Let me generate a fresh set of these things. So let's get rid of all of these things. So for those of you who haven't seen this program, this is the program. It's a little Python code. We're using Python here. And uh, it just generates, on the computer, it generates a bunch of tosses. Um, how many tosses does it generate? Uh, OK, so let's generate 100 tosses. So little, or maybe it generate 500 tosses. Then probability will look better. OK, and then we have this situation. OK, so given this definition, can you tell me So as I said, there are three things. There's experience E, there's a task T, and there's a performance metric P. And I claim that this program is a machine learning program. Okay? So can you tell me what is the task here? So the task is obvious to figure out whether it's fair or not. So head or tails fairness is, is, is the task. What is the experience? So number of data that's coming in. And what is the performance metric? Sorry? So how, how do I say that I'm getting better? How do I say that I'm getting better? Or why do I even say that I'm getting better? I'm claiming that I'm getting better here. During the coin is fair, and yeah. more number of tosses are getting here and saying it. It's going peaked. It's going more peaked, right? OK. So the probability distribution is shrinking, right? That means more area is being excluded. Right, so a lot of lot of this area. So I know from now by now that the coin is not anything which has a fairness value between there and there and there and there. Right. So the, intuitively, I understand that the probability distribution is shrinking in in the amount of extent that it is covering. Right. And therefore, I'm understanding the problem with more certainty. Okay. So that is my intuitive measure of performance. But if I were to tell the computer. How would I tell the computer, tell me whether I'm getting better or not? So the computer itself must have a metric, right? Which says that I'm improving, okay? So how do I take this intuition that all of you are feeling that, you know, the probability distribution is becoming sm smaller, and how do I turn it into a number? How do I take the this? Range of the Sorry? The range of the term and find the number. And it is near to point So you can say, you're saying that I can take this to be a measure of Metric. And it is near to 0 0.5. So 0.5, it may or may not be near to because I can run this. I can run this. So 0.5, if you take 0.5 to be your uh, sort of 
uh, this thing that's not very good because I can take the fairness of the coin, adjust the fairness of the coin to be 0.9, okay? And then run my code again. And now I'll have this kind of distribution, right? So everything, so why is this fiddling around? So if I change the fairness of the coin, it's going to, it's going to change, right? So the, this, the, the curve will start now moving towards this direction. So if I look at, if I set my computer program to have a coin, which is got fairness of 0.9, the curve will look like that, right? So setting it to 0.5 is not a good idea. But we don't know what we are setting, right? So remember, that's the important thing. Somebody else is setting it for you, right? And you only have the data, and you can only see this, right? So what is it that you're going to do? So one, me one measure is, of course, to do that, right? To do that. But then supposing I had a probability distribution, which had two variables in it. So here, there is only one parameter to figure out, right? So there is one parameter, which is theta, the, the fairness of the coin. But supposing I had two parameters, theta 1, theta 2, given my data, right? Then this is now a, a graph in two variables, right? So there is theta 1 here, and there's theta 2 here, and this is some sort of surface, right? So then, you know, and if I have more and more variables, which is typically the case, it goes out of my intuition on what to do, right? So I must have one simple measure. So then what? What do I do with that? What do I do with that? So, so remember, you need to have a measure which says that you're getting better as more data comes in. Okay, and all of us agree that the intuition is that the curve is shrinking. So as the area the curve is... Uh, Sorry? Between 4 and 5. Uh, the one axis is more. Y axis is more. Okay. But remember, every probability distribution is normalized to 1. Okay? P of theta given d, d theta is equal to 1. So the area under the curve is not going to tell you anything. Right? That's a probability of every probability distribution. It's just normalized to 1. So area under curve is not going to help you. OK, the area under curve is always 1. Huh? Full width at half maximum. That's like a truly spoken like an electrical engineer. <laughs> OK. Full width at half maximum. OK. That's one possibility. But then if I have. A five-dimensional probability distribution, how do I compute the full width at half maximum? The differential? The differential? Of the curve? Okay, so I want a general metric, okay? So all these little, all these things that you're suggesting will work for one situation or the other. But supposing I have a five-dimensional probability distribution, okay? There are five variables I want to know, or three variables I want to know. Then, you know, once I go beyond three variables, my geometric intuition is going to fail, right? So then I have to go back to some th something algebraic, right? Some algebraic property of this thing. Okay, so let me tell you the answer. The answer is not particularly intuitive, but again, if you're an electrical engineer, you should, you should, it should probably be somewhere else. What you do is you compute the entropy of the probability distribution, okay? So what you mean by that? I compute this object. summation p of theta given d into log p of theta given d, okay? And this is for a discrete distribution. If I have a continuous distribution, I integrate, okay? So this, this is either this or it's integral d theta, okay? And you can see this completely generalizes straightforwardly to any number of variables. If I have 20 variables here, I have 20 summations. If I have 20 variables here, I have 20 integrations, okay? And this is now a number. It maps the whole thing to a single number. This is the number, okay? Because I'm integrating out. I'm summing over all the possible values of p theta and d theta. Okay. Now, why why is this the chosen metric for for evaluation? Okay, because this is telling me this, as you know, is a measure of information. Okay. The smaller the entropy, the more information I have about what is going on. Okay. If the entropy is zero, I'm absolutely certain about what is what the situation is. Okay, and if the entropy is very large, I have a lot of uncertainty. Okay, so typically, what is taken to be a measure of performance, one very important, at least useful measure of performance, is just the entropy of the probability distribution. Okay, so if the entropy of my probability distribution is reducing, that means my measure of performance is getting better and better. Okay, so whatever says it's not working, you're checking. Okay, right. So now. 
is it obvious to you that for a situation like this, where the probability distribution is doing that, versus a situation like this, where the probability distribution is that, on this metric I'll score better. Okay? So if you can just see that, so one exercise I want to do for, for, for the, this thing is that take that code, compute the entropy of the probability distribution numerically. So you have P of theta, the code is giving you P of theta, compute this object, P theta log P theta, and for each of those values in the in the this thing, plot the entropy okay, of the probability distribution. So now you will see as you plot as you plot the entropy, as you compute the entropy numerically, you will see that the entropy measure is decreasing. Okay. So even if you cannot do it analytically, you can do it numerically. Okay. So this this again, so this please remember this triad, the experience task P. Okay. This is this is in this case what we call this is just our data. The task that we have in this problem is to find out what, what theta is and the performance metric that we are you going to use is P of theta given D log P of theta given D integral P theta. So even for this very, very simple code, you can set it up as a clean machine learning problem and you know the classical definition of machine learning just goes through. Okay, so what's got? It's it's not working. Okay, again, let me just let me just keep talking. Any questions at this point in time? No. Okay. So then, you know, while all, all of this chaos is going on, let me just take you to where I want to go. Okay. So this is, I I want to now take this situation where you have where you know how to handle uncertainty <coughs> at least in simple problems. I want to go to a situation where you are actually ending up with a complex probabilistic question. Okay. And as I said, you know, the whole idea is to try and do Bayesian networks. So the simple example of a Bayesian network is what I'm going to try and demonstrate here while these guys are trying to set up my computer. Okay. So for this, I need so again, please raise your hands if you now know the Monty Hall problem and you know its solution. You, you, know, the, you know the Monty Hall problem. Okay. Thank you. So nobody knows the Monty Hall problem? I do not believe this. Okay, there are two people who know the Monty Hall problem. Okay, fine. So then I need two volunteers, or at least I need one volunteer, okay? And I need everyone else to participate. I'm going to do this experiment here, okay? Which, and then we'll try to analyze it as a Bayesian network problem to see what, what is going on, okay? So the experiment is, it's not really an experiment. It's more like a game. But this game is very illustrative, just like the coin tossing game is illustrative. Okay, so I need a volunteer. There are chocolates. <laughs> Come. Okay. So it's a game against where all of us are playing against him. Okay? So we are, we are collectively Monty Hall. What I'm going to do is the problem is very simple. I'm going to put this chocolate into one of these three glasses. Okay? You don't know which glass it is in, but I know and everybody else knows. Okay. I'm not going to put it like that so that you'll be able to know where it is. Okay. So I'm going to put it so that you can't see. Okay. So now what he has to do is he has to choose a glass okay, to figure out which of these things under which of these glasses the chocolate is likely to be in. What I'm then going to do is I'm going to reveal one glass okay. and show you that it's empty. Then I'll ask you whether you want to change your choice or not. Okay, is it all clear? Okay, so will you just turn around just for a minute? Okay, so right. So we can here's the chocolate. We can put it in one of these glasses, and then we'll ask him. Okay, so you can now choose. Okay, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> any mini any more? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no. So okay. So he has chosen this glass, right? Fine? Yeah. Okay. So now I tell you that there is no chocolate in this class. Okay. Do you want to change your choice? So this is the question. Do you want to change? Does he? He now knows that there is no chocolate in this class. Okay? I'm uncertain now. So you were uncertain even at the beginning, right? You didn't know which, which. So you just chose one. 
Now I've lifted this glass up. Okay, so I know for a fact that there is no chocolate in this glass. I'm asking you, do you want to go with your choice here or do you think you want to change? So based on this observation. So you came here, yeah. you chose one of these three, yeah. okay? I now reveal this yeah. and I tell you that the chocolate is not here. Do you want to change your choice? So you can either go with your choice, in which case I'll reveal this glass to you, and then if the chocolate is there, it's yours. Or you can change your choice, and you can choose this glass, and it may be the chocolate is not there, or it may be the chocolate is there. Now, the question is, what should you do? And the question is a question of general strategy. Right? As strategically, you might have a gut feeling about what to do, but strategically, what should you do? Okay, so you can, you can make your gut, gut choice right now, and then we'll analyze it strategically. Okay. You'll take this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's your chocolate. Okay, but then what should you do generally? This is the question. So I have, I have five chocolates. I have five remaining chocolates. I can have five remaining volunteers, and you can see out of five. So I've, I can do this experiment six times, right? And then, so thank you. So does someone else want to try? Okay. Yeah. Come. Yeah. Okay. So you can step up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the question is clear to everybody, right? What what the algo of the game is. Okay. So I put it here. So now he knows that I put it in the middle glass. Okay. So there is already prior information, which is not so cool. Which is not part of the analysis, but okay. Anyway, so the one I just put it here, and then we call him and let's see what what he says. Okay. Okay. I hope you are not looking in. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> right. So there's your choice. So everybody knows where the where the chocolate is, and now you have to choose. Okay. <laughs> So they're smiling. That basically means you might have chosen right, <laughs> or you might have chosen wrong. Okay. So what do you want to do? Because of the smile, you know. <laughs> 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 you want to choose this. <laughs> okay. So yet again. So this time, that means from the audience, you must not smile, right? You must not say anything more, okay? So you're giving him additional information. All of these complexities I cannot model in my this thing, okay? I will just model the simplest classical version of the, of the this thing, okay? So can I have one more choice? Ladies? Okay. Yes, yes. Participation is what counts. <laughs> Okay, so I've used this glass, I've used this glass, so I shouldn't use this glass perhaps, right? Yes. yes. So let me just put it again in this glass. Okay, and then let's call her in and, okay, good. So now let's call her in and see how, how it goes. So it seems as if, yes, come on in. So it seems as if, you know, my analysis is going to tell you something completely wrong. Okay, so, so no smiles, no hints, even unintended hints from the audience. Take your pick. This one, okay. So now let me show you this one. So, so far what has happened is two people have stuck to their original choices. And both of them have won. Okay, now right? I've okay. So she has changed her choice. Okay. And unfortunately, <laughs> okay. But anyway, I'm going to get the chocolate. <laughs> You're getting the chocolate nonetheless for participating. Okay. So the point is that at least we've done the experiment three times. Two times people who did not change their choice won. And the one time that someone changed their choice, they did not win. Okay? So we can go on, keep on, keep on doing this thing with three choices, with the remaining three chocolates. But what I want to show you is, so this, this problem is the paradigm of a complexity, complex, complexity plus uncertainty problem. Okay? Now, what, what is your gut feeling? So if I just take an audience poll, how many of them, so here's the experiment. How many of them do you think that you should switch? If you think you switch, switching is a better strategy. Okay, first of all, do you think there's a strategy to this or it's completely random? Everybody thinks it's random. Okay, then there's no point in doing the analysis anymore. 
<laughs> okay, so let me assure you that there's a strategy to it, okay? It's not random, okay? There is a well-defined strategy and the answer is you should always switch, okay? So I don't have 100 chocolates to do this experiment on, but if I had 100, 100 chocolates, you would see that people who are switching consistently at their strategy will tend to win more, although, you know, you did not, <laughs> but people will tend to win more as you, as, you, as you use switching as your strategy, okay? So there is a well-defined strategy for this. But did you have any gut feeling about it, that whether you should switch or not? Maybe as there is only three, yeah. we are uh, having that problem. More than So this is exactly my point. So if I had now, if the game, if I made the game like this, that I had 10 glasses, and the game is that you have to choose one of those 10 glasses, okay? And I will reveal the eight other glasses in which there is nothing. Then would you switch? Yes, right, you would switch, right? Then definitely, because you know that eight glasses have been ruled out. You have chosen one glass, and so the other thing has to be in the other glass, right? It's, it's now in either of these two glasses, right? And what is the probability that it's in this other glass? That is really the question. Okay, is that probability higher than the probability in the glass I chose or is it lower? Okay, that is really the question. Okay, so this is a standard problem of Bayesian networks and the way we do it is this. Okay, so what is a Bayesian network? So I'll come to this, motivate, using this as a motivation. So this is now working, right? So let's, let's just see if I have. Okay, and I have asked people to download this library called Pomegranate, which is a, Okay, so again, it's not working. Okay. Ah, so it closed it, it became very unhappy again. Okay, never mind, I'll just do it on the board, doesn't matter. I have a situation, so uh, let me try to analyze this as a pro problem in probability theory. Okay. So I have here a random variable called price. Okay. This random variable can be in glass one, glass two, glass three. So this random variable takes on three values, one, two, and three. I have here another random variable called choice. Okay, of who? Of the guest. So in the original Monty Hall problem, it's a TV show. Someone comes to the TV show and you know, that's the guest and he, has, he or she has to choose. This also has three, three choices. And now there is Monty Hall himself who can also reveal one of the three glasses, right? Or one of the three boxes. Okay, so that's also one, two, three, okay? So let me call this random variable pi for price. Let me call this random variable gamma for guest and this random variable mu. Right. Now, let's try to understand these as probabilities. What is the probability that the, that the price is any one of these glasses? One by three, right? So probability of price is one third. What is the probability I choose any one of the glasses? So this is without, you know, <coughs> smiles from the audience, prompting, etc., and things like that, right? So this is also one by three, right? What is the probability of what Monty does? Now this is this is the complicated part, right? Because here I just don't do a one one by three, okay? Because here what I will do, so in this experiment, as you saw, what I did was contingent on where the price is and what the guest chose, right? So these two things influence my decision, okay? And this is why this is a paradigm. I have certain variables which are independent and certain variables which are dependent. Okay, now I have to set up the contingency table for this, okay? So this is basically saying the probability of mu 
is conditioned on the, pro the value that pi takes and the value that gamma takes, pi and gamma. Okay? So this is a conditional probability table. Okay? This choice is conditional on both these two values. Okay? And therefore, I draw an arc from these two. Okay? So that means that this node, the value that this node takes is conditioned on the value of these two nodes. Okay? Now what happens here? So can we work out this conditional probability? Suppose the price is in 1. Okay? That means pi is equal to 1. And suppose the guest chose 1. What will be Monty's choice? Will he choose 1? So he will choose 2 or 3, right? So the probability, let's write down this table, example of one of these things. Mu is equal to 1, given pi is equal to 1, gamma is equal to 1. What is this probability? It's 0, right? So if the price is in 1 and I have chosen 1, I'll never reveal, Monty will never reveal that one. So this is 0. <coughs> probability of <coughs> mu is equal to 2, pi is equal to 1, gamma is equal to 1 is? How much? 0.5, right? There's equal probability of these two things happening. Okay, so this is half probability of mu equal to 3, gamma pi equal to 1, gamma equal to 1 is again half. So is this clear? Okay. Now, how many such alternatives do I have? So there are three choices for this, three choices for this. So there are nine, and there are three choices for each of these things. Okay. So there are twenty-seven such numbers. Okay, which reflect what this guy is going to do, what the sh host is going to do, right? And that sets up the entire set of probabilities. Okay. And now, once I have this thing. What I'm really interested in is this probability. So I will, Jack, can you just lift the screen up? Oh, that's fine. I'll just, let, let me, let me. So it's not working again, right? Okay. We'll see what to do about this. Okay, so then what is this probability? Probability of pi gamma mu. What does this mean? This is the probability that the price is in a particular glass, the guest has chosen a particular glass, and Monty has chosen a particular glass. Right? Now, by the product rule of probability, this is P of What does this mean? This means this is the joint probability of all these three things happening together. I apply the product rule once, and I apply the product rule two times. Okay, and now this probability <coughs> I have completely modeled through this bunch of numbers. This probability, these two probabilities, are independent of each other. Where the price is and where I choose the glass are independent of each other. So now I have this probability. Okay. What is the question that I'm interested in? What is the question that I want to ask in terms of a conditioning? So at the end, so what happens? I come, somebody comes, chooses a glass, and I choose to reveal a glass. So which of these two states is known at the end of that stage? So when the guest comes in and chooses a glass, then gamma has been set right, to some value. I can choose 1, 2, or 3. So I know gamma. Right? And then Monty comes in and makes a choice. Right? So then mu has also been set. Okay? What remains unknown? The value of pi. I still don't know where pi is. Is pi 1, is it 2, or is it 3? Right? I know still, I knew one of them. I know that, let me call this mu1. Pi is certainly not equal to mu1. Right? So if, if let's say Monty, Monty chose two, 3, I certainly know that pi has to be between 1 and 2. It cannot be 3. Right? So this is, this is struck out. The moment this is revealed, this is struck out. Right? So I now have two options. It could be either here or it could be here. Okay? So the question I'm trying to ask is, 
what is the value of pi given this is the question I'm trying to ask right given that I know what choice the guest made given that I know what choice Monty made what is the value that the price is in one two or three okay and now this is where all of this whole business about Bayesian networks comes about how do I calculate this probability <coughs> given that I have this probability so I know this probability I know this I want to calculate this probability okay, this is what I want to calculate so can you tell me it's very elementary but it con contains the crux of the matter exactly so this is this probability is probability of pi gamma mu divided by which probability probability of this one right probability of gamma mu right okay correct or not So we are using we are using the product rule on this and this, right? So p of again look at it p of a b is p of a given b into p of b, right? So now I'm using this block as b and this block as a. Okay, so I have this. So whatever I do, the whole strategy is I will always try to use this because this contains all the information, and I'll divide it by this. Okay, by divided by whatever I want to do, divided by. Okay, and now what is this? P of gamma and mu. Okay, so this so this is where two very important things come about. One is called the conditional Okay, so this object is a conditional. It's conditioned on something. And there's another object, so this is this thing, p of pi, comma mu, and then there's another thing called the marginal, okay, which is this. Now, what is p of gamma mu? P of gamma mu is sum on pi, p of pi gamma mu. Okay, it basically means that if I sum over all values of this, whatever I am left with must be the remaining part. Okay, this is essentially using the sum the sum rule of probability theory p of a plus p of a bar is equal to 1 okay so if i sum over all alternatives for pi i'm just with left with the alternatives for gamma and mu okay so now i know this quantity from this contingency table therefore i have everything i require to eva evaluate so i know this quanti quantity directly from the contingency table i can derive this quanti called uh, quantity from by summing over a whole bunch of values from the contingency table and therefore i can calculate this okay once, once you do that summation, that summation has to be done. You can sit with a big piece of paper and do the sums because there are 27 such numbers. You have to pick out exactly the right numbers. Once you do the summation, and this is where the computer helps you because you don't have to sit with a big piece of paper and do the summations. You will see what the answer comes about is that P of, supposing I chose one, okay? I chose one, Monty revealed three. And the price is, so you now want to ask what is the probability that p equal to 1 given gamma equal to 1, mu equal to 3, okay. This probability will come out to be one third probability of pi equal to 2 given gamma equal to 1, mu equal to 3, will come out to be 2. So you just have to sum these contingency tables. Sum, you know, set, set up all the values that you have for these alternatives, and do those summations and do this division. And then you'll see that this is the answer. Okay. So if you choose one, there's only one third probability of you getting the uh, getting the right answer, whereas there's actually a two thirds probability that's in the other thing. Okay. And now this you can understand this intuitively, as you know you suggested that if I had a situation where I had lots and lots of boxes maybe the price is here okay you chose that and now the game is that i will strike out 
everything but one. Okay? Then clearly you can see that the good strategy is to switch. Because there is only, so if there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in this example, if you choose randomly, there's a one by eight probability that you've got the right answer. And there's a seven by eight probability that the prize is in the remaining boxes. Right? But now six of them have been revealed. Right? So all that seven by eight probability is now concentrated on the only remaining open box. Right? And therefore, it makes great sense for you to switch. Okay? And you can take this. If you have a 1,000 boxes, and the game is that I choose any one of the 1,000 boxes, and the remaining 998 are going to be revealed to me. Right? You can clearly see that it's better to switch. Okay? It's just because it's very small numbers here, it's not easy to see this. Okay. But now, this, this, this framework that I have, you can do two things on it. You set up the probability <coughs> tables like this. And I'll give you an example, which is not a game example, but a real, real life example of software testing, where you set up the example like this. And then what you want to do is, you know some certain values of these variables. You want to ask, what are the probability of the other values of these variables? Okay. And you can see that this is a standard, this is the way a standard diagnosis problem would be set up. Okay, so let me give you an example of how so this, this is basically, I have not given you a formal definition of a Bayesian network, but this is essentially what a Bayesian network is. It is a bunch of nodes where you have, so let me be a little bit more, more formal. A Bayesian network is a bunch of nodes, okay, a little bit more technical. It's actually a directed acyclic graph, okay. So what do you mean by a directed acyclic graph? This is a bunch of nodes. There are arcs which come from one node to the other. I cannot have a situation where I have, so it's directed, okay, but it's acyclic. There cannot be a cycle. So the it cannot do, it cannot go from here to here, here to here, and here to here. Okay? So these nodes cannot have cycles. Okay? So that's where the acyclic part is, and it's a graph because you know you have nodes and links. Okay? So what is sitting on these nodes are random variables which are exhaustive and mutually exclusive. That means each of these random variables completely exhausts the property of what this thing is going to do. So for instance, the price has to be in one, two, and three. Right? So this is a mutually exclusive and exhaustive choice of where the price can be. Similarly here, similarly here. And once you set all of this up, when you draw arc between this, it basically means that this variable depends on this variable. Okay? And this is what I said right at the beginning, that we want to do causal modeling as opposed to just blind statistics. Okay? <coughs> so the whole exercise here <coughs> is to go to your domain, figure out what are the important variables, figure out what depends on what, and try to model that through these contingency tables. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one very standard problem of this is software testing. Okay? So I'll give you that software testing problem. In fact, I, uh, that's a part of the exercise that I want, want you to do. So I have a software. So the, the problem as it, as it will be given is very similar to this. Okay? So I have a software which is not working. Okay? It might not be working because there's a bug in the program itself or there's a fault with the hardware. Okay? And now how do I figure out which of these two alternatives is correct. Okay? And now what is given to me is an additional piece of information. So just like Monty comes and reveals the glass, right, and that brings in to me additional piece of information. Okay? Similarly, one additional piece of information is given to me, okay? which is something to do about the state of the machine, the state of the hardware on which the computer is, on which the program is trying to run. Okay? And from with that additional state of information, you're supposed to try and figure out whether you know this thing is working or not. Okay, so again, that's a simple, simpler kind of problem. A more complicated problem, which actually is in real life, is you take your car to the mechanic, to the to the to the service center. Okay. Instead of the mechanic opening up the boot and tinkering around things like that, there's a data feed on the car. You just jack it, jack it in. The engine sends it some information. The carb sends it carburetor sends the same information, the tires send it some information. So just like the gauge that you have, or so the meters that you have on the dashboard, all of that information is now pumped through this data feed into a computer. Okay? Given that, given that my <coughs> tire pressure is so many psi, given that my engine is doing so many revs, given that my carburetor is you know, em emitting so much, 
which parts of my car need replacement okay or is my car completely okay or you know do i not need to do anything like that okay so this is now a big diagnosis problem so instead of diagnosing a human being you're trying to diagnose a car okay so you now have a whole bunch of supposing your tire tire pressure is so there are some very obvious things like then your tire pressure is low okay something is okay so okay supposing now you try to crank the car and the car is not starting okay that there could be a multiplicity of causes why the car is not starting your batteries could be down you might not have fuel there may be something wrong with the engine etc and things like that and now you have to figure out which of those alternatives are there right and now you can do interventions you can try and check is the fuel meter showing full okay then if the fuel meter is showing full that reduces the probability that you know there's something wrong with the you know it, the car is not starting because there's no fuel and so on and so forth okay so this whole set of big networks that you have combined with all the kinds of probabilistic relations that you have are typically what is used for doing these complicated decision making processes okay and uh, there are so i will give you so all of these things were there in my slides which don't seem to be working so there there are two companies there are actually several companies so there's one company called bezia you can look at look them up on the website there's another company called hugin okay and there are lots of white papers there which explain to you practical examples of all of the usage of bayesian networks okay so supposing i have a recommend i want to build a recommendation system right how would i do that using bayesian networks right so if i or if i want to build a classifier okay so this you can think all of these things you can think of as you know even you can think of the, even this is a classifier okay if i frame the question in a different way if i frame the question as tell me what is the probability of pi not equal to gamma given mu and gamma okay so this is telling me is the price in the glass i chose or is not in the glass i chose okay so this is a binary classifier okay for my 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 problem at hand if i just reframe the question tell me what is the probability of pi not in being in gamma okay so either this probability is you know 1 or it's 0 okay so either the you know the 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 glass i chose has the price or it doesn't have the price okay so all classification and so if you want to think of this as, so how would you set this up as a very simple so if i want to do a regression task okay just a simple regression task how would i set this up so if you look at my standard regression linear regression task i have y is equal to a let's say ax plus some noise okay okay and this is my data so i have a, i have a set of yi's and a set of xi's we are corrupted by this little noise and i want to find out what is a okay this is my standard regression task and the way i usually do it is to do a least squares fit right so i try to calculate the square difference between this function and this function and then i try to minimize the that square difference and that gives me what is the best value of a okay the way i do it here is that i set up a node like this i set up a node like this okay this node is my y node this node is my x node okay and there's a link between these two nodes okay and now the question is what is the probability i put on this link right because every link must have a probability associated with it right that's the whole point of this thing So now the question is, what is the probability I put in, put in to this link? So do you have any idea? How would I, how would I model this probability? And this will tell you, if you can answer this question, this will tell you why you square, minimize the squares. So what is the standard technique for minimizing? What is the standard regression technique? I take y i minus a x i. i square it i sum it and then i minimize on what on a right so i set del del a to 0 and i find out what is the value value of a which satisfies this a star and that is my best estimate for the regression coefficient right why am i minimizing the squares is some is there something special about the square function i could minimize fourth power 
mod apps. So what is so special about square? Why am I? Why is it least squares? What is so important about squares? Negation would not be there. Sorry. Negation. Yeah, but if I took abs, that would also work. If I took fourth power, that would also work. If I took sixth power, any even power will work. So what is so important about squares? No, no, that is, that is true for any function. So I have to do this. This will tell me that the function is stationary. And then I'll have to do del del a square to make sure that it's positive. Yeah. That you know, that's exactly a maximum rather than, so it's a minimum rather than a maximum, OK? So that those, these two operations will, but that, that's an operation that you do for any function, right? Any function that I have to maximize, I will have to set its first derivative to 0 and make sure that its second derivative is positive. Then I have a minimum, right? But that's true for any function. So in particular, I could even take mod. Right? That would also fix the problem of positive and negative. Right? I could take fourth power. I could take any positive function, any function which always stays positive. So what is so great about squares? Why is it always that we're doing least squares? So this is where I want to illustrate why you know, black box methods and this method has so much of difference. So here in the black, this is the statistical black box method. I have given you this function. You put it into the square, least squares operator, and you take out the, and give me the answer. Okay? But it's not telling you why I should be doing least squares. Right? So the answer why I'm doing least squares is actually given when you think about this problem probabilistically. And what is happening is this, why you're doing least squares. So let me just formulate this as a Bayesian problem, and you'll see what, what is going on. So just think of the data that is coming in. So your data, this is y, this is x. When you plot the data, it looks something like that, right? And hopefully what you're trying to say is that there is actually some straight line which this data is representing, and there's a whole bunch of noise around it, okay? Some fluctuations around it, okay? And that is what I've written here. Ax plus all this random bunch of noise, okay? Now this noise, so let me write this as, yeah, okay, so this now. Now this noise, if it is a random variable, it must have a probability distribution, right? So what is the probability distribution of this thing? If this is to be a random variable, it must have a probability distribution. Any random variable has a probability distribution. What is the probability distribution of this? Can this take? positive value or a negative value? Can it take both positive and negative values? In other words, can the data point be above the line or below the line? It can be, right? So this is a random variable which is both positive and negative, right? And it's a continuous random variable. Okay. Does it have a mean value, roughly? On the mean, do I have any expectation about this? On the mean, it should be 0, right? So on the mean, it should not be pushing me up too much or pushing me down too much, right? On the mean, it should be pushing me up and down as often, right? So this random variable has a mean zero, and it has some variance, right? Some variance which is telling me how far away from the true line I will see my data points, right? So it has some variance. So it has some, so it has a mu, and it has a sigma. So mu is zero in this case, and the sigma has some value. Can you tell me if this is suggesting any distribution? Sorry? Yes. So this, this why, is, why should I take this to be a normal distribution? So the distribution that I take for this is normal. So I take p of epsilon is e to the epsilon minus mu whole square by 2 sigma square, 1 over 2 pi sigma square. But why should I take it to be this? That is certainly a distribution which will satisfy these kinds of quantities. But why, why do I take it to be this? Is this the only distribution which will satisfy? So again, just like I'm asking, why do I take squares? To what is so fundamental about squares? I'm similarly asking, what is so fundamental about the normal distribution? Why is it even called the normal distribution? What is normal about it? So are there abnormal distributions? So what is, what is so important about the normal distribution? So the normal distribution looks like this. It 
it's a bell, bell shaped curve right and this is the probability on the y axis your prob probability pro probability of x and this is the x and here's your half width at full maximum okay yes i heard some nice important word yes so the central limit theorem okay so there is this very important theorem hindu is this booked or something i i okay fine fine right so so then okay so there is this very important theorem which says that if you add a whole bunch of random numbers together no matter what distribution they came from the distribution of the sum is going to be normally distributed okay so what is the statement you add lots of random numbers together their sum is going to be normally distributed no matter what distribution they came from okay they can you can choose them from any distribution as long as you add sufficient numbers of them their distribution is going to be normally distributed this is the assumption that is very sneakily made when you're doing regression you are assuming that the disturbances that are coming in your data are not from one any one particular source but from many many sources each of them is has some random distribution and you are adding all of them together and therefore the net disturbance that you see must be normally distributed okay this is the assumption that is made in linear regression but it's never made explicit okay now once you do that you will see why the square has to be minimized it's very easy because then it's from this I now know that p of epsilon is normally distributed, but epsilon is what? <coughs> epsilon is y minus a x, right? Just from the regression equation itself. Therefore, p of y conditioned on x is, now I just take this, replace it there replace the epsilon by y minus a x it's e to the minus y minus a x whole square by sigma square 2 1 by 2 pi sigma square 1 okay did you see what i did this noise the disturbance is normally distributed but then the regression equation tells me that y minus a x is just the noise. The difference between my observation and my explanatory variable is just the noise. And therefore, the value of the explanatory variable conditioned on what I have is just given by whatever is this probability distribution. I just replace epsilon here by this. Okay? And therefore, I get this. Okay? Now, this is the value of y that I should expect given that x has a certain value and a has a certain value. A has a certain value, okay. and now what am I? What am I really interested in? I'm interested in probability of A given the pairs x i y n. Okay, this is what I'm interested in. Okay, so if I now set this up as a Bayesian network, what I'm really interested in is I need to get some of this out. just remember again my coin tossing problem just for those of you who are from the last class so p of a given the data this is what i'm interested in so i'm casting the regression problem not as a least squares fitting problem but as an estimation problem okay p of a given the data my data is this bunch of numbers okay that must be p of switch data given a p of a divided by P of the data, Bayes theorem. What is the probability of getting the data given that I have an given that I have a? It's pr precisely this, right? So it's e to the minus y i minus a x i whole square sigma square. And how many such data sets are there? As many data sets I have, so I have to take their product. Okay, I can just take the sum there. Okay times the probability of a okay that so this is this this is this the denominator i don't care about it it's just a number okay and now what do i want to do i want to maximize pro i want to find out which is the place where the probability is maximum right so i want to find out so now this will give me some probability distribution for a right so this is p of a right and i want to maximize 
I want to find out where is the mode of the probability distribution. I want to maximize P of A. So I want to maximize del P del A, right? And therefore, you can see that when I maximize this object, I have to maximize the exponential because E to the X is maximum whenever X is maximum. It's a monotone function, okay? It's minimum whenever this is max minimum, this is maximum whenever this is max it's a monotone function, okay? So then I have to maximize this object, okay? And this is where the square comes in. The reason I'm maximizing this, y, or the reason why it's least squares is because I am trying to maximize a probability which is of the form e to the ax square, okay? And then that will be maximized whenever, you know, the numerator, the, 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 the argument is maximum, okay? So this is why square is important. Because I have taken the normal distribution to be my probability distribution, the square is there. And the square is filtering through all the way here, okay? So the square is the only choice I can make. So now you can, you, now you can answer the question. Why am I maximizing squares? Because I have made an assumption for what my disturbance is. I have made an assumption that my disturbance comes from a normal distribution, okay? And that is because I have assumed a central limit result, okay? So this, this is where this comes about. And now you can set this up. So therefore, if I were to do regression, I would say that, you know, there is this y variable, there's this x variable, and on this link, I'd put this probability distribution, and then I'd use my Bayesian network tool to find out what is the best value of A, okay? So I can set up all of this as a regression problem as well, okay? So let me see if I can, so this is not working, right? It is not working? Yes? Okay, so that's a bit of a flop, but uh, yeah, so maybe let's break for coffee. Let's just go and let's have coffee outside. We'll come back. Let me see if I can get this set up. And then I'll show you. So I had I, I had asked, I don't know if, whether you guys had got this thing. So there's this library called Pomegranate. It's on GitHub, which is a library for Bayesian networks, just for doing Bayesian networks. Okay, and you can do all of these calculations that I'm trying to tell you. You can do them automatically using this library. Now, this is not the most feature complete library, nor is it the most popular library. But what is very nice about it is that the API is very intuitive. Okay? <coughs> so if you just look at the, you know, the, 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 the query language, it's very intuitive. And you know, just for starters, it's a good place to start. Okay? And it has the Monty Hall problem completely worked out. And then you know, I want. I'll give you the other problem, the software testing problem, and just see if you can implement it as, as the thing. So we'll try to do some of those things. So right now we can maybe just step down the hall for coffee and then come back in 20, 25 minutes. Okay, it's working now. Okay, so then shall we just, since we've got this working, shall we just give two minutes for If you can just wait for two more minutes, since this is now again working. Okay. So I'll just take you through the code, okay? Uh, right. So let's see. So this is doing the Monty Hall problem. Jait, can you increase the brightness a bit of this thing or no? Okay, it's not particularly bright. Okay, so uh, you need to use NumPy and you improve pomegranate. Okay, now remember the Monty Hall problem. What we had was there are three states, right? So there's this guest state, price state, and Monty state, right? So what we are saying is initialize the guest node as a discrete distribution having three values, A, B and C, and assign each of them to a probability of one third. Okay, Sim, do the same thing for the price distribution. Okay, for the Monty distribution, since the Monty node depends on both the price node and the guest node, you have to set up a conditional probability table, and there, what you're doing is you are setting up all the 27 conditions that I was talking about. The, all the 27 conditional probabilities. The order is guest price. Okay, so the first column is what the guest does, 
The next column is where the price is. The third column is what is Monty's choice. And the final column is what the value for that is. Okay, so you can see this probability con conditional probability table and see if it makes sense or not. So if if the guest chooses A and the price is in A, then Monty chooses A with probability zero. If the guest chooses A, the price is in A, Monty chooses B and C with probability half, and then you go your whole way down through all of these alternatives. Okay? So this is now your conditional probability table. So if you remember, we had the guest node, sorry, the prize node, the mon the the prize node, the guest node, and the Monty node. So this is doing all the probabilities for the Monty node, and there are 27 such probabilities. So once you do that, then you take this thing and set up these states. So these are now you have to, so this is just the syntax. You're saying set up the guest node with the name guest, prize node with name prize, Monty node with name Monty, et cetera, and there are three states. And what you do is now instant instantiate your Bayesian network so that's your Bayesian network. Just give it a name. That's all you need to do to instantiate it. And then what you can do is you can add the, so you have your network object. You can add the nodes to it, S1, S2, S3. And then you can add the edges. So you've added the nodes. So the nodes just are the blocks. This is a random variable with three values. This is a random variable with three values. This is a random variable with three values. And now you have to add the arcs. So what depends on what? So here you're saying that S1 depends on S3. Remember what S1 is? Guest. So S3 is conditionally dependent on S1. S3 is conditionally dependent on S2. Okay? So you add your now arcs, and then that's it, network.bake. So you now set up the whole thing. Okay? Once you do that network.bake, your network is now set up. And now you can ask it questions. You can ask it questions. So the first question you can ask it is, supposing I make an observation. I make an observation that the guest choice is A. Right? Now tell me, what are my beliefs for the rest of it? Okay? So this is, technically, this is called this so-called forward-backward algorithm. Okay? So there's an algorithm which says, okay, you know, manipulating all of those probabilities. So if I set something, how do I now see what is the new state of the network? Manipulating all the conditional probabilities, just like I was showing you, A, B, C, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so there's this forward-backward algorithm which will manipulate all the probabilities, and it'll now give you now the beliefs. What is the new state of knowledge that I have for every node of the network? Okay, and you will see now once I do this, once guest chooses A, pretty much nothing happens. Okay, nothing changes in the network. Okay, because when the guest chooses A, the probability of the price being in any of the other three, uh, any in any of the three of them, is not changed. Okay, so once you print the beliefs. Once you do this here, nothing <coughs> will change. But then you can do a you can do another thing, which is take this down, look at the last line, and now I say guest chooses A and Monty chooses B. Okay, now this is a more detailed observation. And then again you ask the network, what is the state of observation now? Okay, and let me just quickly run this so that I don't know whether this thing is going to work or not anymore. So and I will you will see what happens. Right, so what it did is, so let's just scroll up. What it, what it is doing is it's dumping for me the two queries that I made, okay? So look at the guest variable. It is chosen A with probability one, okay? Look at the prize variable. What has happened? Nothing. It's A, B, and C with probability one third, one third, one third. What has happened to the Monty variable? Since the guest has chosen A, it will choose C or B with probability half-half. Right? So all of this is being done automatically. Once you've set up the network, once you do this thing, it's being, it's being done automatically. All these probabilities are being updated automatically. And now, once I do the other case, and this is where the interesting thing lies, this is when the guest has chosen one. Monty has chosen B. Okay. What is the probability of where the prize is? Okay. Guest has chosen the first jar. Monty has chosen the second jar. Okay. Now where is the where is the probability of the prize peaking? 
look at the values. So clearly, if, if Monty is open, B, the price cannot be in B. So that's 0. But A and C are now have a different number. There's one third on A, which was your choice. And there is two thirds on C, which was not your choice. OK? Yeah. Hmm. Why the probability for C is more here? Why is the probability for C more, right? So that's what I was trying to illustrate by having 100 boxes, right, or 10 boxes. Let's say you have 10 boxes, and the game is now you choose one, OK? And then Monty comes and opens the remaining eight, OK? So when you choose one box, what is the probability of you're getting the right answer? One-tenth, right? There are 10 boxes. You just randomly choose one, one-tenth, OK? So what is the probability of getting the wrong answer? 9 by 10, right? Now, Monty has come to that 9. He is only operating on that 9 by 10th part of your choice. He is not touching what you have touched, right? So that 9 by 10th choice, he is revealing all the eight boxes, right? So then there is one box remaining. So that probability of 9 by 10th of getting the wrong answer is now concentrated on that box, right? Because you have re revealed all the remaining other choices. So now there is one by na 1 by 10 probability of you getting the right answer and 9 by 10 probability of you getting the wrong answer. But then you must switch because 9 by 10th of the probability is concentrated there. Right? Okay? So that, that intuition is obvious when you have a big number of boxes. But even the, so the whole point of these Bayesian networks is even for such a simple problem, our intuition does not work very well. But the rules of probability theory, if you manipulate them systematically, will give you the right answer and okay. My laptop is conked out again. So, but you can see that this network is telling you that C has probability two thirds, okay, and A has probability one third, okay. And now the whole idea is to build more and more complicated networks, which will give you much more domain information. And these variables need not be discrete variables; they can be continuous variables, they can be textual variables. So, what you do with it is really entirely up to your imagination. Like you know how know how complicated and cool you want this thing to be is really limited by your imagination okay so I think that's a good point to break and once they come back maybe we can do a couple of more things and later on we'll try and fiddle around with some of these networks a bit. okay shall I start so there's been a request to explain this least squares business again I think I rushed through it okay so can I just take 15 minutes to okay <coughs> Okay, so let's get back. What I'll do is I've set up this uh, problem that I was talking about. We'll, we'll analyze this problem uh, collectively. But several of you during the break told me that this was too fast, so I'll just go through it again a little bit slowly, okay? Uh, not making any assumptions that you know statistics. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> No, I just heard normal distribution coming from there, so I kind of assumed that everybody knows what this is. So the moment I showed mu and sigma, some people said normal distribution. So I said, okay. <laughs> that means we are on. Okay, so let's talk about. So I'll go step by step, again with that regression problem. So the problem statement is the following. I have pairs of data xi, yi, which I can plot on graph paper. So plot y and x. And for every pair, I point up, I put, so let's say i goes from 1 through n. So I have n such data sets. And when I plot them, they kind of look like that. OK, something like that. So those are my data sets. Okay, and I want to understand, is there any relation between these two variables? Okay, any functional relationship between these two variables? Okay, and the simplest functional relationship I can assume is that y is equal to ax. That means y is proportional to x. Okay, if y increases, x, depending on the sign of a, either increases or decreases linearly. Okay. Now, this is my model. This is my model for the data. Okay. What is happening in my collection process is that this model, if this were the true model, if this were the model for the data, then the data would look exactly like this. It would look exactly like a straight line. All my data points 
are exactly on the line, which is described by y equal to ax. Okay. This is exactly what would happen. But my data is not like that. It's scattered all over the place. Okay. And that is because when I'm doing the data collection, there is an unspecified mechanism which is coming and disturbing the data that I collect. Okay. This is, so I'm very fond of Greek symbols. This is the Greek symbol epsilon. Okay. <laughs> this is epsilon. Okay, and it's also there because it is called the error. Okay, so this is the error of my data. Okay, so that's epsilon. Right. So this now I have to model this. Just like I've modeled my data, I have to model the error as well. Okay, and now there is this very famous sort of realization which dates back almost to the early eighteenth century by the great mathematician called Gauss. From Gauss's law, Gauss's distribution, various other kinds of things, who realized that if I have disturbances which are coming from a multiplicity of sources, so my epsilon is actually epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 plus you know, lots and lots of these kinds of epsilons, then no matter what these things are, this thing has a well-defined distribution. Okay? And this is called the central limit theorem in probability theory. Central limit theorem. So it's, it's not central limit theorem. It's central limit theorem. It's a limit theorem. And it's central because it's a central result of probability theory. Okay? It's a central limit theorem, which says that if I add random variables like this, and I suitably divide by, okay, there's a technical part, which I don't want to get into necessarily here. I have to divide this. Okay, I just can't add them. I have to divide them by a certain quantity. Then this quantity is distributed normally. Then this error is distributed normally. What do I mean by normally? It means that this distribution has this bell-shaped form. So the probability that this error, so this has a mean, which is called mu, and it has a spread, which is given by sigma. And this is the value of the error. This is the probability that the error will have this value. Okay? So the most probable value of the error is around the mean. And then there's a spread around the mean given by this quantity sigma. Okay? And this function, this bell-shaped curve, is given by this distribution. P of epsilon is given by what is called the Gauss distribution or the normal distribution, standard distribution. Epsilon minus mu whole square by 2 sigma square divided by under root 2 pi sigma square. Okay. This is called the normal distribution. Now you can see whether it makes sense or not, you know whether it kind of looks like this or not. You can just see this. This is a number. It's independent of the variable that I'm interested in. So this is just a scale. Don't worry about this. This is e to the minus x square. Okay. So this is the function e to the minus x square. So again, let me not disturb this thing. So if you just remember what e to the x looks like. The exponential function, e to the x against x at x equal to 0, function value is 1. Okay? And let me put a minus x. Okay? So then x equal to 1, it's 1 by e. So e is 2.7. So 1 by e is smaller than 1. So it's kind of going to go down like that. Right? And this is e to the minus x. So as I go to this side, this will keep on growing. Right? So it's like that. But now if I look at e to the minus x square, right? if it's on this side, then also it's positive. Right? So then it will now do that. Just like it's decaying on this side, it will also decay on this side, because this doesn't care about the sign. x square is 
positive, whether x is negative or positive. Okay. So this is this is where this distribution comes from. Okay. Now all this is saying is, where is the maximum of this distribution? You can see the maximum is at x equal to zero, right? X equal to zero. This is the maximum. That is saying instead of x equal to zero, this maximum is shifted to a place. to a place mu. The maximum is at mu. And the spread is, so here the spread is 1. Here the spread is given by some number, sigma square. Okay. And all of these factors, the 2 here and the 2 pi here, 2 pi sigma square, all of these things are there so that, like any probability distribution, I must have integral p of epsilon d epsilon equal to 1 where I integrate from minus infinity to infinity. That's all the values that this probability distribution can take, right? So the error can take any value. So let's just look at this once again to understand this completely before I move on. Here's the error. The error can take any value from minus infinity, sorry, plus infinity to minus infinity. The error can take any value, OK? But the probability that it takes any value is set by that distribution function, OK? e to the x minus mu whole square by 2 sigma square. And this, what is the significance of this sigma? Sigma is this. Okay. It's the spread of the curve at half the function value. Okay, when I look at the function value, I look at the point where, so if this value is something, I look at the place where this value has become exactly half, and I draw a straight line. The places where this intersects is 2 sigma. Okay, it's that, that thing. Okay. And now this curve kind of becomes almost close to 0. You can see that if I set x to be, so, so as I move away from mu, this becomes smaller and smaller, right? Because there's a minus sign. Okay, so this curve is becoming smaller and smaller. So once I'm here, so when when this, so this is mu, when this is roughly three sigma, and this is also three sigma, this probability has dropped. Okay, it's become very very small. So the practically, for all practical purposes, epsilon is like mu plus minus three sigma. So although this error can go from minus infinity to infinity. At a practical level, it will never go between plus minus of 3 sigma. Okay? So if plus sigma is 1 and the mu is 0, that means the error in this case will be roughly between plus minus 3. Okay? So if I have mu equal to 0, sigma equal to 1, that means this random variable, the disturbance, will roughly go between plus minus 3. Although in principle, it can go from minus infinity to infinity. Okay. And this, this condition is just normalization. It means that some value of epsilon must be realized. Some value between minus and infinity, infinity must be realized. Okay, So any probability distribution is always normalized to 1. The area under the probability curve is 1. OK, right. So now this is my model for the error. This is my model for the error. Okay, It's a normal distribution. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not exactly like, it's not a simple mathematical function that, you know, so there are all these other kinds of things like location and some other stuff. So they all account for errors in case of that example. Yeah, exactly. So for instance, it's like, so the, Dura, the example Dora is suggesting is supposing I looked at real estate prices as a function of, so my y. Square feet of. Yeah, so my y is real estate. Price x is equal to area of the property, right? So area of the property. Now what I would expect is as my property area increases, my price will also increase, right? So I would expect at least something like a times x, where a should be positive, right? So increase of this will lead to increase of this. But this is not always seen. So I might go to so you know, if, if, I, if, I, if I just go down the road to the village, Kanagam village, I'll get a pretty big you know, house for you know, a 
fraction of the cost, you know, where if I went to say, let's say, I don't know, some fancy part of Chennai or something like that, right? So there are other things which are coming in to change this regression. Since this is, there is a, there's a certain amount of truth in this. This is absolutely correct. That the bigger the house I choose, the more I'm supposed to pay for it. So this is a good model of real estate prices. But there are confounding variables. And that confounding variable is, say, the location of the place, right? So then, or it could be a particular street in which there's power supply or there's a garbage dump or whatever or something like that because of the real estate prices go down there or you know there's a noisy school or something like that so these are all confounding variables right and from this mass so what i'm going to observe is really this relationship i'm going to observe so this is a well defined thing i can go and observe i can go to the house and i can measure its area so there is no uncertainty in this this is a well defined clearly defined variable right so Yeah. I'm asking the price of a house for some thousand square feet. Right. Uh, next to neighbor house, I'm asking. So that guy is giving different uh, value. That can be uh, taken as the error. It's a deviation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So. Plus or minus epsilon. Yes. No, no. So this epsilon is a normal distribution, right? So epsilon can be positive or negative. Positive or negative. Depending on what mu is, it can be positive or negative. Okay, so if mu is zero, epsilon will be positive or negative, right? So this this plus is just an algebraic plus. It doesn't mean that it's always increasing. Okay, so uh, yeah. So for instance, this variation even within a locality, the variation between landlord to landlord, right? That is also random. I don't know what the guy is going to say. He might not like me. He may like me and reduce the price. He may not like me, increase the price, and so on and so forth. Okay, so all of that uncertainty that you have goes into this. Okay, error variable. Okay, and the safest thing to assume, if you do not know further, is to assume that this is normally distributed. Okay, this error variable is normally distributed because it is supposed to come from a multiplicity of causes. Okay, so in one case, it may be the landlord. In the other case, it may be the locality. In the other case, it may be something else, whatever. So lots of things. It, if it's close to the beach, it might be you know very pricey, whatever. So, so this is like an example of this uh, regression problem. Okay. So now you would like to know what this is. Okay, so what is the idea of regression? The idea is that supposing I could eliminate this thing, supposing I could remove all these confounding factors, what is the true relationship between price and area? That is the whole goal of regression. Okay, I want to remove all of these confounding factors. Okay. So let's see how we go about doing it. So the recipe is always you square the error between what you see and your model, and you maximize on the this thing, on the variable, on the regression variable that you're interested in. That's the recipe. Okay, now I want to show you step by step how this recipe comes about. Okay. So now, what is the question I want to know? The question is, I want to know what is A. That is the question. I want to know what A is. So the way we do it is the following. I know that I'm going to model this thing, P of epsilon as e to the x minus mu, sorry, epsilon minus mu, whole square by 2 sigma square, under root 2 pi sigma square. This is my model for the error. I want to know what is my data. So now let's cast this as the standard machine learning problem. What is my data? My data is this bunch of areas and bunch of prices. Okay, and I have a whole table of these things. So, you know, I have n of these numbers. Okay. I want to know what is the probability of that regression variable A given the data. This is my question. Y equal to AX, this is known, this is observed, this is the unknown quantity. I want to know what this A is, because then that will tell me what is the true relationship between area and price. So I want to know this. Okay? So this is my problem. This is what I have to obtain. Okay, so how do I do this? So I now apply Bayes' theorem to it. So let me take out uh, Jair. He's not here. Can you just take this up? Take the screen up? So I need some more blackboard real estate. I need real estate. OK, 
can you blank out the projector? Okay, so I need this. Okay, so now I'm going to apply Bayes theorem. P of A given D is P of D given A into P of A divided by P of D. And I have to understand each of these terms individually. Okay? So this term, what is the probability I think A is? Okay, what do I know about this from my model? So A is a number. And this is again where I want to emphasize causal versus black box reasoning. What do I know about A from reality? I don't know its value, but I know something else about it. What do I know about it? It's a positive number, right? So if my area increases, my price has to increase. Okay? So I know it's a positive number. So then what is the kind of probability distribution I can give on this object? If I look at this, I can say that I will give it a uniform probability whenever A is positive, but whenever A is negative, I'll set the probability to zero. Okay? That means that this number can always stay positive. Okay? It's not a negative number. So I will put a uniform distribution like this for A greater than zero. This is my probability distribution for P of A. What do I know about this? What is the probability that I'll get a bunch of data like this, if the value of the regression uh, parameter was A. Okay? Now, this is the part that you have to calculate by combining the model and by combining your model for the error. These two things, you combine and get this object. Okay? So let's see how we get this object. So you get this object in the following way. You want to know what is the probability of getting this data, xi, yi, if the regression parameter is A. So then you manipulate the regression curve. You take this curve and you say epsilon is Y minus A times X. Right? This comes from the regression curve. You are interested in this quantity. What is the probability of getting D is Xi, Yi, given I know the value of A. Right? This is this quantity, P of D given A. Right? Now, this is a simple exercise in change of variables in probability theory. I know the probability distribution of one random variable. It is related to another random variable. Tell me the probability distribution of this random variable. Okay? So I have Y is equal to F of X. I know the probability distribution of x. Tell me what is the probability distribution of y. Okay? This is the problem. Okay? This is the transformation that I have to do. And the transformation in this case can be done very simply because of this linear relation just by taking this and replacing this in the probability distribution for epsilon itself. Okay? So the probability distribution for this quantity, p of xi, yi given a, is just e to the minus. I take this whole thing and replace the epsilon here by y minus ax. Okay, so that is y minus ax minus mu whole square by 2 sigma square under root 2 pi sigma square. Okay, and then as someone mentioned, this error should have zero mean, right? So I strike out the mean. My model for the error is it's not biased. Sometimes it will give me a positive. Sometimes I go to some landlord, he will charge me more. Sometimes I go to some other landlord, he will charge me less. Okay? That is my model for the error. Okay? So then this is now the probability of getting the data if the value were A. Right? This is the answer. And what have I done? I have combined my regression model with my model for the regression error. Now what do I have to do? This is just one value of the data. What is the data? Actually, it's all of those values. 
right? So then the data is the full data given A is not just one of them, but all of them. Right now, each of these data are assumed to be independent. So it's like if I go to, if I measure the value of the area and the price in one place, and I go and do another measurement, the assumption is those two measurements do not influence each other. Okay? So I measure the area of, of one flat, I ask what is the price, I get a number, I go somewhere else, I measure the area of the flat, I ask for the price. These two numbers are uncorrelated. Okay? So then, probability independence, P of A and B is P of A into P of B for independent events. So that's what I do here. So I have n such events, right? So the probability of D is now a multiplication of all these probabilities, right? So probability of my first x1, y1 given A into my second x1, x2, y2 given A all the way up to all the data sets I have, xn, yn given A, right? So I went to n houses and measured my prices. And each of those gave me a number. So I multiply all of the probabilities. That is the probability of the data, my full data set, all the numbers that I have. Right? So now you can see what is going to happen. If I multiply these probabilities, I will be multiplying these exponentials, each with a particular value of yi and xi. Right? And now multiplication of exponentials, e to the minus x1 squared, e to the minus x2 squared, da 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 da, is e to the minus summation xi squared, right? So these multiplications just go up into the exponent. So then what I have is, therefore, I take this out, put d here, and I replace this by the i's, and I replace this by a summation over all my data sets, OK? So now this is, now everything is ready. Everything is in place. So now I take this and put it back there. So I can replace this. So p of a given my data set is this quantity. P of A is just a constant. It just means that whenever A is negative, I have to discard that data. And now, this P of D, I can fix by just saying that I must integrate. So integral 0 to infinity, this A can be anything, must be equal to 1. Okay? So that will fix the denominator. Okay? So this P of D, I don't need to model at all. Okay? This, is, this is just normalization. So I don't need to worry about this. OK, I've modeled this. I've modeled this. And I, I, I now have this. And now what I do is I look at the data set. And then I plot P of A. A, P of A versus A. OK? And what does it look like? This is also a Gaussian. It's a Gaussian in A. It's a normal distribution in A. right? With some, you have to fiddle around with it to put it into standard form. But you can see its probability distribution is e to the a of whole square, right? So now I can ask, what is the most probable value of this distribution? And the most probable value is obtained by maximizing the probability del p del a equal to zero. I do this thing, right? And the most probable value for therefore, if I have a bunch of these things, you can see that this thing is maximum whenever this thing is minimum. Right? So e to the minus x squared is maximum when x is equal to 0. So whenever this thing is minimum, this function is maximum. Right? Therefore, I must now come here and minimize this function. Right? And this is my least squares minimization. Okay? I have to minimize the square difference between my data points and my model. Okay? So when you do it like this, you, do, you have forgotten completely. So now the recipe, what is the recipe? The statistical recipe is take your data sets, plug it into. So the, the statistical recipe is minimize with respect to A sigma yi minus A xi whole square. Right? This is your statistical recipe. Minimize with respect to A this object, and this will give you a regression, best regression field. You see the noise has completely disappeared. All these assumptions that you made about the error is absent in this 
recipe. Okay, and that's why it looks like a black box. Okay, I send in something and you know something comes out. Okay, but actually a lot of assumptions have gone in to arriving at this recipe. Okay, and it's always good to try and understand when you're using a statistical formula, what is the causal model that is underlying that statistical formula. Okay, so in this simple, so you can go to any statistical model, and you can try to analyze it like this and try to understand what is the causal model that is being you know, imputed by, by the statistical formula. Okay? So now this tells you why it should be squares, and not mod, not power 4, or any other function. Because that is the model you made for your error. You assumed Gaussian errors, and that leads to least squares. Okay? Good. So can we just bring this down now? So let's come back to this uh, Bayesian network stuff. No, maybe I'll stop here. We'll come back to the Bayesian network stuff after lunch. Why, do, why didn't you speak? No, this can, can this, uh, OK, fine. Are, you know, OK, fine, fine, fine. Okay. Unless it's going to take a long time. It shouldn't take a long time. Let me explain the problem, and then we'll do it. OK, so let's switch these lights off. So let's look at this. So coming back now. So from regression, I want to come back again to Bayesian networks. Okay, and this is like a standard thing. Okay, so why don't you have a look at this problem? It's called Fred's Lisp dilemma. I'll read out the problem. So Fred is debugging a Lisp program. Lisp. I don't know why the choice has been. <laughs> no, it's not very old. So I think you know. I, okay, I, I think computer scientists. It's a, read, a book written by a computer scientist. So I think they really like Lisp. Okay, so Fred is debugging a Lisp program. He just typed an expression to the Lisp interpreter, and now it will not respond to any further typing. Lisp interpreter is hung. He can't see the visual prompt that usually indicates the printer is the interpreter is waiting for further input. As Fred, as far as Fred knows, there are only two situations that would cause the Lisp interpreter to stop running. So there are exactly two alternatives for this surface effect. What is it? There are problems with the computer hardware. There's a bug in Fred's code. Fred is also running an editor in which he's writing and ed editing his lips, Lisp code. If the hardware is functioning properly, then the text editor should still be running. And if the editor is running, the editor's cursor should be flashing. Additional information is that the hardware is pretty reliable and is OK about 99% of the time, whereas Fred's Lisp code is often buggy, say 40% of the time. Okay. So now I have this problem. Okay, and what is the question? So the question, of course, is because I'm discussing this, is to construct a belief network. So this belief network is just the Bayesian network again. Okay? To represent and draw inferences about Fred's dilemma. Okay? So you now have to say, take all of this information, <coughs> encode it into a bunch of nodes, and into a bunch of probability arcs, and then figure out what you can do. So, and what are the questions? So the first thing is to construct the belief network itself, the Bayesian network itself. And then, right. So then and there's a bunch of hints for how to go about doing this. Okay? So you have to first decide. So again, going back to my previous, you know, the, the relax idea. So you have to decide on your representation first. What are your representations? First, decide what your domain variables are. Okay? These will be the nodes of your network. Okay? Five or six Boolean variables should be sufficient. So yes, no type variables. Okay? And then decide what the causal relationships are between the domain variables and add directed arcs to the nodes from cause to effect. Okay? So this is like if hardware is not working, editor will not work. Okay? If hardware, if the editor is flashing, editor cursor is flashing, hardware is probably working. Okay? So you have to build up all of these causal nodes, causal links. Okay? Finally, you have to add the conditional probabilities. So these are the conditional probabilities like in the Monty Hall problem. right? So if guest chooses something, prizes in something else, then condition on those two things, Monty will do something. So that's where you have to set up your conditional probabilities. Okay? And then you have to use the information about the hardware reliability and how often Fred's code is buggy. So these, as you can tell, will be the top nodes. Right? Fred's code is buggy one-fourth of the, well, you know, 40% of the time. That is unconditional on anything. The hardware is reliable 99% of the time. 
that is not conditioned on anything. That is like you're choosing where the price is and choosing where the, what, what the guest is going to choose. Okay? So other probabilities haven't given to you exclusively. Choose values that seem reasonable and explain why it, in your documentation. Now this is very, very important. Okay? In a real life problem, you are not given probabilities. You have to make your own guesses for what those probabilities are and you have to make an informed guess. Okay? So your success as a sort of data scientist or as a causal modeler will depend on how good you can model these probabilities. Okay? Then what you do is show the belief network of each variable before adding any evidence I about the list visual problem. So now you, have, you set up the network okay? even before the experiment has been conducted. So it's like we set up the Monty Hall problem even before I say I've lifted any of the glasses. Right? And then I lift the glass and that is my evidence. Okay? So show the belief network of each variable before adding any evidence. Then add the evidence about the Lisp visual prompt not being displayed. Okay? So now it's like picking up a glass. After doing belief updating on the network, what is Fred's belief? He has a bug in his code. So it's like I pick up the glass and now I'm asking you, do you want to switch or not switch? Okay? So you have to evaluate the probabilities. So now you do that. And now furthermore, further evidence is coming in. Supposing that Fred <coughs> checks the screen and the editor's cursor is still flashing. right? What does this mean? What effect does this have on his belief that the Lisp interpreter is misbehaving because of bug in his code? Explain the change in terms of diagnostic and predictive reasoning. That means you now have to take all of this information, punch it into the Bayesian network framework. So you can take my uh, Monty Hall code as an example for how to do this, for the syntax for pomegranate, etc. Set up this thing and just see if you can reproduce. So this is very similar to the Monty Hall problem in a certain way, okay? but it has a more, much more realistic example and this is the kind of things that will typically come up you know what will happen in a uh, uh, an even more real life problem is the number of nodes will start growing in number the number of causal links will start proliferating and you know then you really have to go to the machine to do the reasoning you know this your intuition will completely break down okay but here in this case here, these are still problems where you can more or less intuit what is going on so i think this would be a good example to try and see so do you have any idea of what just, you know, this is an example where you can get a reasonable guess about the probabilities. At this stage, what, what do you think? At this stage of probability. So again, let's just quickly look back at the probability statements. Fred's code is buggy 40% of the time. The hardware is reliable 99% of the time. Okay. At this point, this visual prompt is so the Lisp interpreter is hung. At this point, what should Fred's belief be? He writes 40% buggy code and the hardware is 90%, 99% okay. Okay, so I, as you can see, there's no consensus even in the room. Okay. <laughs> So, okay, do you agree this is again a problem that you can analyze or do you think it's completely random? Again, like I'd asked before the Monty Hall problem. Okay, hopefully you now agree that this is a problem you can analyze using Bayesian networks. Okay, so, okay, so even very, even, the point I'm trying to drive home with this example is that even for very simple problems, our intuition about probabilities is not very good. Okay, this is just our problem of reasoning. Okay, we don't have good intuition of probability. If I give you this number, I say machine is okay, you know, machine fails one in a hundred times and code fails, you know, 40% is two in three times roughly, right? Uh, well, is it? No, three, what is 40, 40, four by 10, one, two, two in five times, right? Two in five times the code fails, right? And this is happening. So, so the, the machine fails, a, machine, machine fails one in a hundred times, code fails two in five times, okay? So why don't you set up the network, set up the network and do the reasoning on the network using this library. Do you think this is something that can be done in the afternoon? Yeah? So everybody can try to download that pomegranate code and try and just set up the, take my Python code, the earlier one, earlier one on the Monty Hall problem and just modify it. Okay? And we can do it on the board just to set up the network. All of those preliminary things we can do on the board and then the coding you can try and do uh, with this thing. Okay. So I think I'll, so I'll leave you with this problem. Where is this problem coming from? This is coming from this book by Kevin Korb, who was actually here in this institute 
a couple of years back. Uh, um, he's, he's, he's at Monash University in Australia. And he's written this very nice book called Bayesian Artificial Intelligence, amongst which you can quick take, quickly take a look at the contents. Uh, OK, so as I said, Judy of Pearl. I mentioned Pearl before, and Chris Wallace. Chris Wallace is again, uh, Chris Wallace is Kevin Corb's supervisor, and he was a very well known Australian um, machine learning expert. Okay, so if you just look at the contents, there's first Bayesian reasoning, and then there's this Bayesian networks, and there's inference, and there's whole lots of things that you can do with Bayesian networks. Okay, so I'm just giving you an example from here, which is like just a very early example of what you can do with Bayesian networks. It's a very simple example. Okay. So there are many other books, but if you want to get started, this is a nice book. Um, I should not say. <laughs> you know what the answer is. <laughs> yes. OK, yeah. So I think I'll stop here. Okay, so in the afternoon, we'll come back to this, this bunch of things. Okay, so I'll just hand it over to Durai. Can you hear me? All right. This is going to be a much lighter session. <laughs> so, uh, so what? So we're going to be running these parallel tracks for a while, and we'll start converging at some point in time, right? The parallel tracks is that uh, if you really look at the data science problems, like if you look at the entire life cycle. There are a bunch of things you need to do. And we are doing two things. One is you basically understand the theory behind why you are using something, right? Like, you know, and we are going through fairly slowly, uh, step by step, and trying to understand one by one what, what we're going to do. So that is um, what happened in the morning session. Simultaneously, we need to do other things too, right? For example, um, one question that we were discussing during the break was, how do you even find out problems to solve uh, you know, for machine learning? So how do you identify the problems? You know? How do you know that this problem only you require machine learning to solve and not by some other techniques like database and this and that and that kind of stuff? Second thing is, let us say that I decide to solve a certain problem. How do I get started? What are the features that I need? What are the, how am I going to collect the data? What data am I going to collect? That's another one. And we'll come to that in, in a future session. We've not talked about it too much. You know, like, how do you build these models? What are the parameters in the model? So we assumed, like, if you, if you take the example of this house prices kind of stuff, as, as a simple linear function, depending only on the square feet of area. But all of us know that that's not true. There's another variable, which is called location. The houses in RDR are differently priced than the houses in, you know, Velachery, for example. So, do you make the equation a little bit more complex? Now it depends on multiple variables and that kind of stuff. And so you start, start with a simple model and you start building and more and more complex models. And then you start observing you know, what is going on. The data that X1, Y1 he was talking about is a list of house prices that houses were sold. And some of this data is available from public sources. So I can gather this data and then start building this kind of stuff. So in this session, we're going to do something uh, slightly different. Last, uh, in the last session, uh, last workshop, what we did was, we said, how do you go and find data on the web? And then how do you grab it? We didn't really spend a lot of time on how to manipulate it, except just parsing it. Um, you know, to go recap, we said, okay, you can use URL lib to go and um, get a website web page. 
then you can use something like beautiful soup to parse it and then pull out the text and pull out the links and then use them. And today we will talk about two other ways of gathering data. One way of gathering data which is basically myself and Vinay will work through this is using what is called RSS feeds. Okay, this is probably a really simple problem has been solved. So we will show you some code and you know we will show you how to do it um, and I will explain to you what it is. Okay. And then the next thing we will do is how to gather data from Twitter. And that is myself and Faisal will, you know, will work on that a little bit. And we've already done all these things, so uh, we'll show you the code, and we'll also make the code available. Uh, we'll put it on Value from Data GitHub repository, so you can download these kinds of things. How many of you know what RSS is? Okay, so <clears throat> basically, what happens is um, websites provide a lot of data. So for you to, if you want to go and read the data, you can just visit the website, type the URL, go and read it. But if you want to have a machine to take the data and then, you know, do something with it, um, it's one way is to go and scrape the websites. But earlier, you know, before, um, you know, scraping of websites started becoming more and more popular, um, somebody came up and said, you know, and actually started with blogs. Somebody came and said, hey, what happens if you can take all these data in a dynamic website, you know, um, if I keep publishing a lot of articles, writing lots of articles, what, what if we can create a protocol by which I can make a request, and this is not the HTTP protocol to get the web page, but just get the, all these list of items, like in the case of Hindu or New York Times, get a list of news items get a list of, um, you know, prices for stocks, get a list of uh, blog posts written, okay. So they came up with uh, uh, syndicating this information from one site to another. For example, Hindu publishes a story, I want to take part of the story and put it in my website, and is there a way I can syndicate that information into my site? So that is why RSS comes from, it is called, um, it, it's changed its name um, a lot. The very first time uh, the RSS name meant something really geeky. It's called RDF Site Summary. Okay, at that time they were using a technology called RDF. Then it became Rich Site Summary, and now it has become really simple syndication. So it's the same acronym that keeps changing names, but it's a really simple syndication. It's a protocol. It's basically an XML file that indicates um, how and what are the articles, what is the title of the article, when was it published, date and time, a brief description of the article, and then the link to the real article. These are the four essential elements. There are some others, and, and then there is RSS 2.0, RSS 3.0, there is, R, you know, it started with 0.92, and there are like three, four different formats, but I think they are stabilizing. Uh, so this RSS is a format using which you can actually go and get the information. You, just like a website URL, you have a URL with RSS in it. So let us start with, let's go to some website like Hindu. Do you want to pick some website? TechCrunch. TechCrunch. Okay, let's go to TechCrunch. You don't have much belief that Hindu has an RSS uh, feed there. So. So TechCrunch is one of these uh, sites that publishes lots of technology articles, right? And you want to go and get um, information from TechCrunch. But instead of going and reading the whole TechCrunch, what I want to do is I want to just quickly look at all the articles TechCrunch published. Then I want to go to one particular article and just click on it. I can theoretically do it on TechCrunch site, but I will be going through pages and pages of information. So what if, if somebody just gave me um, just a list of all the articles published on TechCrunch today, so I can quickly look at it and say, okay, I want to know a little bit more about this article, and then I can go and get it. So today we've been having, uh, <laughs> but this is not the projector problem. What happened, this is the wireless stuff, or? Yeah, it's Wi-Fi, it's slow. Are you on Wi-Fi? Okay, it's come. Oh, okay, that's fine too. So typically, how do you find out whether the site even has an RSS feed? 
Um, there are two, three ways of finding out. There is a way you can find out using uh, by writing a program. There is another way you can normally what you can do is when you scroll through at the bottom, every site has something called an XML sitemap. So you can go to the XML sitemap and it'll indicate the page. Or normally when you go to the footer, somewhere they it'll say technology entertainment. Does it say RSS? So okay, you do want to do a control U, control U. Okay, and yeah, look for RSS. It doesn't have one, so let's we jo let's go to. I think the Hindu or something else has has it. Oh, it's a feed. Um, okay. By this time, no. Okay. So there is an RSS site search engine. I'll 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 show you that also. Uh, we should have probably used that. You're looking for RSS or just do the same thing, you know, control U type RSS. Yep. So normally you go and do this. If you can you scroll it up a little bit? Yeah. If you see this, there is a link. The application type is RSS plus XML. In some cases it may not be XML, it may be RDF. Okay. And then it'll have a tech crunch title, feed. And this is essentially the URL. So this is TechCrunch slash feed. But that also varies. Um, sorry about that. So it, essentially what, uh, what you can do is you can, in some of them they'll say slash RSS, slash blog. So don't, you can't pay attention to the feed itself. But this is how you essentially you find it. There's a simpler method of finding it. And I'll show it to you. Um, uh, I'll we'll give, find the link and I'll, I'll show you the stuff. There is something called an RSS field, RSS search engine, and then you can just go and type in TechCrunch, and it will find out all the fields and give it to you. And so it basically, essentially, does this automatically, you know, program. So once I get the feed, why don't you click on the feed and see? Once I, when I, yeah, just take copy that URL and just click on it, open it in a. This is how an RSS feed looks. Completely unreadable, uh, but if you really look at it, it says this is the RSS, and then it, there's a bunch of XML namespaces and all. So essentially, a feed consists of a set of channels. Each channel has a set of items. Okay, they have different formats. Like this uses what is called Atom, but Atom is also a feed format, uh, like um, the XML format. Um, so essentially, it'll say this is the link. This is the description last build date, okay, and then language, and then how frequently it is getting updated, but those are all, some of these are optional. They may not be there in all of them, okay? So, essentially every site has, a, there is a way for you to get an RSS feed of the site. In fact, the, this is normally supported by the site. So when they post articles, they publish these, uh, a, a RSS feed information. So you can go to the RSS feed and if it's getting updated hourly, once an hour you can go and say give me the new set of articles. I can take a look at the articles and I can start analyzing the articles. Uh, can you go to indeed.com? Just search for a job. Data scientist. So when you go and search for data scientists in Indeed, you ca I can go and say subscribe to the email, or in fact I can take this and can you do a control U and see whether you can find an RSS feed here? You got an RSS feed. So I can do a search for a job. I can take the RSS feed. Now I can write a program that keeps on looking at data scientist jobs. And then once you have the link, you can find out who is posting the job. So a lot of interesting, nifty things can be done with this. So, and writing the code is not very difficult because there are some pretty cool RSS libraries. So what happens is, let me explain the process. When you write a blog post, the blog post 
sends out what is called a ping to a uh, server. That server keeps on getting pings every time a new blog post is written. And these pings uh, are taken, and then they said, OK, this is the item. This is the URL where the blog post is written. And then there are certain uh, services that accumulate a certain list of blog posts and give it to you. So Google News is like one of those kinds of things. So there is pretty much almost a lot of newspapers provide this. Because all they, why are they providing this? They'll provide you a news title. They'll provide you a small description. They'll provide you a link. So you can actually put it into your site and then link it back to the original article so that they get more traffic. So this is, you're syndicating the article from this. The original article, you're going to the link and then getting it there. Doing this is not considered copyright violation because they are giving you this saying, OK, you can use this description. You can put it on your site. And that is basically what is, what is happening. All your blog posts also come, come like this. You can you go to any blog. All the posts will also be like this. So what, we'll, um, uh, what I wanted to sh uh, talk about was that we'll show you a small piece of code. Why is this important? This is one of the best sources of finding data for your uh, machine learning application. If your machine learning application is predicting, so we can do a small prediction, right? We can, I can find out the jobs. I can find out the salaries that are for the jobs. In many of these, they mention this. Or location of the jobs, the number of jobs that are happening in certain place. And then I can gather this data and I can start doing some simple plots, right? So this is, I can also go and gather one of the things that we'll show you a little bit later, or and maybe we'll talk about it here, is that we are trying to find out all the jobs so that you can find out what are the skills needed so that we can do um, you know, what is called topic mining, where you can take all these job descriptions that are put out and find out what are the skills they are asking for so that you can find out what are the most in demand skills, most frequently required skills. So there are lots of other interesting analysis you can do. But here in this session, we just wanted to focus on basically what is RSS and how to do this. When I, why don't you take over and just show them the code for? Should I use this link? You can use whatever you want, yeah. Okay, so basically for this link, this was the RSS link to it. Okay, so the first step we need to do is we need to find the RSS link. So there is a free library available. It's called Feed Finder. So you can just download that. Yeah, feedfinder.py. Okay, so this is just a Python program. And uh, by the way, it was written by Aaron Schwartz, the same guy who made Reddit. So we can just save this. OK. OK, so we have it here. So now we are going to use this to find the RSS link. And inside this, you just put in whichever URL you want. And in our case, it is this one. So hopefully, it should just give the exact same RSS link which we saw. And let's check it. Yeah, it's basically the same one. So that's how you get the RSS link. Now, after you have the RSS link, now comes the part where you download the RSS feeds, means all the articles. 
for that there is another library again feed parser okay, you can write it down actually. So, I have already installed it. So, I will not be installing it actually. So, let us go ahead import feed parser. So, you have to pass the RSS link not the website link okay, the RSS link to feed parser and this thing downloads the entire R, uh, R the, XM, the XML file and parses it for you automatically. So, let us do that. Uh, Okay, and since we have downloaded this link, I'll just use this. Okay. So if I print it out, this should be like a lot of data. Okay. So basically, we actually downloaded everything. So let's look into it. What is there? So it's. Uh, I mean it takes the XML format and it like it uh, what, what do you say it divides it into whatever it is for example article uh, how do I explain it better. So, it will take the XML field yeah. and give you you know it will the parse it first and because there are several, several RSS format it will take care of all the differences between various RSS format and then it will give you essentially labels and values as a JSON format. So, or you can also get it as a CSV form. So, it is actually passing itself. Here it puts it into a dictionary. So, let us see. So, let me list out all the keys of the dictionary. So, okay. So, we have feed, status, updated, you know, everything. So, okay. So, basically all our data will be in entries. Okay. So, let us go into that first. Feeds of the entries. So, again, there will be a lot of values because this is all the data. So, let us just choose one, the first one, or we will check the length of it first. Okay, so basically, it returned 20, uh, 20 search results. And we had done a search on data scientists, and now it returned 20 search results. Let us just go to the first one. So, this is it. It is again it is a dictionary, but inside the, okay, let us list out the keys of it now. So, you have the summary detail, the published part, links, title, summary. So, we can just print out the title first and that is the title lead data scientist that is the job title. Now, we can go to the summary. So, it is yeah, this is the sum, we'll print it instead. Can you loop through the title? Yeah, I was going to do that once. So, this is the summary of it. It is clear so far? Okay, so I will just loop through all the titles now. Hopefully, they should print out all the titles. Yeah. So, these are all the 20 job titles. It is readable, right, from the back? Huh? Okay, okay, fine. Yeah. 
So these are just the titles. Uh, now, we, now we can go through the content as well. Okay. So, can you all make out what is there? Okay, so basically that is how you just get everything from RSS feeds. You, you have other things like you can see the date published, author, you know what else. links to it, uh, the summary, source, title, detail, etc. Mostly we just need the title and the content of the article. Yeah, okay, so that is it. Yeah, I have one more thing to show. Uh, Okay, you see this e tag. Okay, this is called an entity tag. Okay, so right now we got 20. We uh, we queried for an one. Uh, we sent the got downloaded the RSS feeds and it sent us 20 items, right? Now it also gave returned an e tag. So this is the e tag. So basically, it's just an identifier for when you you know when you downloaded the RSS feed. So like let's say like one hour later. You again want to download all these things. It will again suppose uh, between now and one hour later, there's just been two new entries. So what it'll do is it'll, it'll still send me 20, but you have already downloaded 20. So if you send back the e tag, it'll ignore the 20 that you have actually sent. I mean, you have already downloaded, and it's just going to send back those two, the two new ones. So it's just to keep getting the latest one rather than everything again and again. So if I do it now with the e tag. tag equal to feeds dot hopefully it should return nothing ah. okay yeah, th this is a problem it's not nothing wrong with the li so library or something it's basically something with the website most websites don't uh, support e tag so well so but now normally what happens is if it, if i had sent it it would give me like zero results because I've just done it like just a few minutes back. Yeah, that's it. Anything, Anything else? Yeah. Do we have the stack load with the RSS feeds also? Okay. All right. Thanks, Vinay. So um, another source of rich source of data is uh, uh, Twitter. But before I move on to Twitter, even in this, okay. all those links that you have, yeah. each link is actually pointing to a job description. So you would, what you would do is you'd get a list of links, then you would filter it based on something. We could have made this slightly better. Instead of just typing data scientist in indie.com, we could have put it within quotes. And we could have gone one step further and put title colon data scientist. So in which case, it look only for things with data scientist. Right now, I think it picked up anything with either data or scientist and then sent you all the kind of things. And that's one of the reasons why you find uh, some of these random jobs in there. Uh, 
the the reason for using twitter is because a large amount of news now is being distributed through twitter and the mechanism is slightly different what happens is i see some really good article on data science i tweet it and then you know i also have a mechanism by which it gets automatically posted into my facebook page uh, get posted into value from data facebook group and those kinds of things so um and people are doing it all over the place any items of news and sometimes they just write a small item of news themselves sometimes they read an article and uh, send it and sometimes they retweet something that is somebody has tweeted an article uh, by the way before i start all that uh, twitter is a micro blogging feature where you can send within 140 characters small piece of information which contains links and some words or some of them may just have just 140 characters of information like if you are quoting someone you can just put quotes and then send it out uh tweet so what we did was we gather we are trying to gather a lot of information about data science and one of the um, really popular uh, data science blog or twitter feeds is one called kd nuggets um kd nuggets is basically uh, this knowledge discovery they come from a very early stages of even before the machine learning the term became popular and um, gregory for example gathers lots of information and tweets about it so what this application actually does is it gathers and uh, faisal will show you all the code so twitter has an api so you can go and register in twitter you need to have a twitter account you put the api credentials oauth credentials then what you do is you say i want some tweets and then i can say i want the tweets from this particular person or i want the tweets with this search criteria you know the search terms and then you start receiving all these tweets and then you can you know they are you, know, you get them as kind of a json format and you can take it and then put it what this app does and we'll go through different steps of this app is that we gather all the tweets and i am mostly interested in saying just by looking at it the bigger ones are like sci- data science big data predictive analytics so these are all the tags that are being used in tweets a lot so can you just go click on predictive analytics so what essentially this application does in this right now open uh, you can go and use it we can publish the information Uh, all we are trying to do is gather large amounts of uh, data and then we want to analyze it for a variety of things for example we want to classify as which are jobs what is news items what are the new terms that are coming up what is the vocabulary so what we did was this this doesn't use any machine learning technology right now all right ideally i'd like to get all these terms using topic mining which is something that we'll do later right now what what we did was we just took the all the tweets um we simply created word cl- uh, basically word frequency and bigram frequency and then faisal gave me that list and then i went through it and said okay these are all the ones that make sense and i marked them and then we created it as a filter and then now we are going to do, we are looking through the tweets and then if any of these terms occur so we created a basic vocabulary and then if any of these terms occur then you know we are counting the frequency of those terms and then we are linking these terms to the tweet so that whenever you click on say why don't you do it on algorithm it's here somewhere i don't know whether you can see it so you'll see all the tweets that will that will have the word algorithm in it so um, so this is gathering data and all these tweets we also we are storing um twitter recently did something really strange they used to provide this complete tweet for firehose through two three vendors there is one called data shift um you know couple of other vendors but recently they came and stopped all that sort of stuff so you but you can get a, f- a small amount of tweets yourself they have an api what is the rate limit 150 180 tweets requests for 15 minutes 
15 minutes. So you can, we'll, we'll show you a program that, you know, just goes and keeps on getting these tweets so that you can go and take a look at it. Uh, is there anything for books? Do we have a link on books? Probably don't have any, I think. Okay. So you would also see um, names of companies, uh, you know, names of communities like Quora, all those kinds of things in here. And so this is basically the application. So why don't you just show them, walk them through how, you know, how it works. Yeah, you, do you have that? You can, yeah, you can show that too. Though that has got, okay, yeah. So there is a library called Open Cali, and uh, this is done by Reuters. What, what they do is, once you give up a certain amount of text, see, what happens is, when you're doing a lot of research, you want to go to a certain area, you want to analyze what are all the companies in this area, who are the people who are the influencers in this area. There is very difficult, it's very difficult for you to do it unless you go through some natural language processing and then what is called entity recognition and all that sort of stuff. And this uh, library is already done all that stuff. Called, it's called Open Calais, it's freely available. You send it text and it will send you back entities. So, um, you want to take over and show? So, this is by uh, basically. Okay, this is nothing to do with Open Calais. So, initially it shows by gram, but you have here like all the results which are given back from open Kali. So you can, can you see? Yeah. You see. So as you see here is like all uh, whatever is written, okay, so I have clicked on what I clicked on? Yeah, industry terms. So it exactly doesn't give exact terms, okay? So open color is not 100% curated as we concerned. So we got all this, we took, uh, it gives more than this actually, whatever categories. So we picked which are relevant for our case. So industry terms or company names kind of things. So what it gives, okay? So from the tweets of Dorai, okay, these company names arrived. So, what Dore speaks about Google, if you want to know, okay? So, this it gives a broad sense of what exactly this person is, okay? So, even if you want to follow a person, or if you want to do something on, okay, can I take this person straight for analyzing for this purpose? So, before doing that, you can just do this and get, okay, this person is mainly speaking about this company, these companies are doing this, or he is speaking about this industry terms or something like that. Okay. Which one? So this gives like clear uh, picture of what he speaks about. So you found some word, okay, you wanted to see what exactly on this word he speaks about. So you got the tweets about that, okay. This gets only latest 150 tweets and does this for you. So it's not full complete tweet uh, list. So it dynamically takes new tweets and does. So, and again you can do that uh, hashtags or at names or who is an influencer. Okay, so if you want to see who are the influencers for Dorai. So these are the tweets where actually Dorai mostly retweeted it or he uh, tweeted with these uh, at names kind of thing. So I'll show even this is like, this is an application where you actually, we made a web interface where you can, instead of using the program you can specify whatever your search terms, terms and you can uh, save that. So for example, so say whatever you want to search in Twitter, okay. So you can search that, okay, and what? ML? 
Machine learning is already searched. Right? They're already there? Yeah. Okay, then go So while you search, it immediately does a request and gets 180 uh, tweets and shows you a preview so that you can decide whether you have to save whatever or still curate your uh, search. So you may search for one term, then you find, OK, these terms to, should be eliminated so you can do that. So if you don't understand what is the search, we how to search in Twitter so you can just see this. How to, this is a help kind of thing, so you can just do that. So it, it allows you to search on the base of uh, date limits and all those kind of things. Let's go to the code and come back to it. Yeah. So uh, I'll show a small code which is. So here you you can see like. Different things I have written as different uh, a Python code as like BMT will uh, download all tweets of a specified user. Okay, whereas you have search where you can search for a tweet uh, tweets in Twitter and you can collect uh, tweet follow and like list. If you have already made a list, you can or if you know someone Dore has made some list. Okay, you know the name and owner, you can download that. So, so this is basically was there. Uh, someone else was written and uh, it was not working because of uh, Twitter upgraded its version. So I just modified a bit to just rest I wrote because slightly modified this to get other things like search and all. This this acting as small library if you want you can use it okay for your purpose. So so what it exactly does is it takes a name. So if you can see that in it part, right? So I'll just show you how it works. So when you initialize, it actually uh, does initialize a uh, new f uh, file DB, SQLite 3, uh, with the right T. And then it actually, then you have to fetch and store in the same DB. So once you initialize, then it's just to store in local. You can just modify it for your purpose. Why don't you try, how is it? PHY? Yeah, PHY what is it? PHY. Do an init first there.
So this information has been stored as like source. If he has typed from other sources, it just gives the uh, Twitter definition for the source as a link actually. And yeah. And from where you have actually tweeted. So if you go and tweet from some other application or something, they'll give their link. So source is always given. So then what exactly is being tweeted? Okay. And created and all those kind of things. So when you search, actually it stores the information who tweeted about it, okay? Who are the followers and all those kind of things. Retweet, counts, and kind of things. So actually Twitter gives a lot of information which are not uh, being stored here. So if you get any tweet, it gives a lot more information than what I'm storing here. I just stored relevant information. Wrap it up in the sense that you can talk to both Vinay and uh, Faisal for more questions. But there are a lot of interesting things you can do. Suppose you want to find all the influences in data science, or for that matter, in cloud computing or something like that. You can find out the, who the most nasty people there, right? You type cloud computing search, you get a bunch of tweets, you take the tweets, you analyze, you can, it's easy to identify the people who tweeted it, take the maximum count, top, take the top 20 people, and then see whom they retweet. So there are a lot of interesting analysis you can do using this kind of thing, and then later you know we can go see what topics they talk about. We can do topic mining, we can cluster the topics, all those things. So we, we'll, as we progress through the workshops, we will try to take some of these applications and try to build them using this. But we wanted to today just show you two ways of collecting data, and we'll make all these sources available so you can.